It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Christina Warren's here. Alex Wilhelm, Wes Faulkner. We have some great stuff to talk about. A lot of AI in the news. Scarlett Johansson, a little mad at open AI. Uh, ICQ says bye-bye. Microsoft announces AI PCs that can help you play Minecraft. Plus, that Rabbit R1 turns out eh, not so great. It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 981, recorded Sunday, May 26th, 2024. Grab your rabbit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show we get together with some of my favorite people to talk about tech. Honestly, that's the only criterion these days. It's got to be people I want to talk about tech with, like the wonderful Wesley Faulkner, who works for someone we can't talk about. But he is on the Mastodon at Wesley83 and is super smart. And now that you're going a little gray, we think you're even smarter. That's the key. Thank you. I used yeah. to work with a host at Tech TV who did not have gray hair, jet black hair. He dyed his temples gray so people would trust him more. <laughs> <laughs> this just means I was made in a lab. Yes. Um, oh, that's good. That I, I have like removed. It. Yeah. It does look like a lightning bolt. I love it. <laughs> anyway, great to have you on, uh, Wesley. Also with us in her world of blur, Christina Warren from, from Microsoft. Uh, actually, from GitHub. From GitHub. There is a yes. distinction. Is there? There is a distinction. Okay. Yes. You don't I have different health insurance. Ah, well, that's a big oh. distinction. Is it good? I, I think so. Okay. I mean, I, I, I prefer, I prefer the, the GitHub health plan if I'm being there you go. Um, honest. But yeah, yeah, you used to I work did. for Microsoft at Channel 9, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So good. You're, you're, you landed well in your little hop. You've also been very busy, I think, this week. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Lots of AI in the news. Huge amount of AI in the news. And honestly, uh, when I got in a big fight with Ed Zitron on, on Wednesday on This Week in Google, when we, a, literal, a literal shouting match, you never want to get in a shouting match with a Brit because they could tear you to shreds with their, with their language ability, right? Um, but he was, uh, he was saying, well, there's no good use for AI. And the first thing I pointed to was Copilot on GitHub, which is amazing. And really useful. So one of the first very, really good uses of LLMs, I think, in the public, GitHub Copa. How, how old is that? It's a couple of years old now, right? Yeah. Okay. So it officially became publicly available two years ago, but we it was announced three years ago. So I've been using it for three years. Yeah. So it's it's two years old, but it's three years old. Like there, it, it's been in various levels of, of um, ex, uh, people have had various levels of access to it for um, a little over three years. It's very good, and I like it. Sorry, Ed. Also with us, my good friend, we had to dig him up because he's been ensconced in childlike things. He lives in my childhood home, Mr. Alex Wilhelm. Alex. Alex. Hi. You're no longer at the Tech Crunch. No, no. My second stint at uh, the home publication has come to an end, and I'm trying some new stuff. So, you know, it's been a week. So not a lot to report yet. This is exciting, uh, though. You're doing the independent thing. That's yeah, yeah. Bravo. So I'm doing well. Thank you. Golf, uh, clap. Golf clap for you. It's it's really different to say you're going to go off and write for yourself, and then the the first day you show up and there's no one else there, and then you have like no support, and you're like, oh man. Turns out working for a big corporation did have some advantages. Um, we're gonna no, we're really gonna get a uh, group of people to go right now to cautiousoptimism.news and subscribe. That's all there is to it. That, I mean, that, that would make my day. But I, I will say this. By the way, uh, notice that thing, subscribed, because I am subscribing to it. So there. It, it, if the website is ugly, it's because I'm not a designer, but I'll work on that. That's, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get that. How is it ugly? I mean, it looks like every other sub stack. That's the problem. Oh. It looks like the generic WordPress template. It looks like I didn't try because I didn't. But um, everybody else's but sub stack looks like this too. Yeah, that's like saying everyone's Cybertruck looks the same, so they all look good. No, they yeah, all look bad. Yeah, all look bad. That's true. 
Uh, reporting and commentary, it says here, on startups, technology, and the stock market. Modestly upbeat. I like that. <laughs> yeah. The whole the whole shtick is I'm trying to find a little bit of space between uh, very important and critical coverage of big tech companies and very overly optimistic early stage coverage nice. of companies like Rabbit. And so it's cautiously optimistic. It's slightly upbeat is the uh, is the idea. Cautious optimism dot news. You're also working with uh, our good friend Jason Calacanis on this week in startups. Yes, I am doing that part time, couple shows a week, and nice. that is uh, paying my half of our nanny while I experiment with newsletters. <laughs> and I am uh, grateful to have kind of two things going on at once. And yeah, I'm just, I, I, you know, I, I needed to try something new. I've been at TechCrunch for another half decade, um, and I love everyone there. But you know, sometimes you just gotta shake it off and. Turn left. It's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's, uh, we know so many people who worked for publications who either because they decided to or because they had no choice have decided to go solo. And I think it's the right thing to do. If you have a voice and you have, and you're smart and you can, and you can write, uh, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a very good idea. Well, so wish you the best. Well, if, if that's the case, I'm doomed. So no, 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 yeah. no, no. Come on. No false humility. Cautious optimism. News. Everybody go subscribe. Right now, right now. Uh, all right, now let's talk. <laughs> ah, what a, what a week we had. Last week was crazy with OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT 4.0, which sounded remarkably like Rashida Jones. Uh, I don't know if you noticed. Did you notice? It sounds just like Rashida Jones. Did you notice that? Yeah, I mean, I, I it's funny because I first got I first thought ScarJo, and then one of my coworkers said Rashida Jones, and I was like, I can hear that too. So yeah, well, totally. Scarlett Johansson thinks it's her. Yeah, uh, I mean that's who I thought it was at first, and then a co coworker said Rashida Jones, and I was like, actually, they maybe have the same more, voice. Is, is the problem? That's the problem. <laughs> they have the same voice. They sound exactly the same. I started uh, playing with ChatGPT when it had a voice months ago. And I said Scar Joe right from the beginning. And that's why I liked it. Because <laughs> I want to talk to Scarlett Johansson. Of course, uh, it turns out Sam Altman's a big fan of the movie, Her. Scarlett Johansson was the voice of the AI in Her. The AI that uh, uh, Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with and gets his heart broken by. It's a prescient movie. You should all watch it. Um, and... It turns out that, in fact, OpenAI did approach Scarlett Johansson, not once, but twice, asking to use her voice, and she said no. But this is what's kind of interesting to me. Washington Post, I guess uh, OpenAI talked to Washington Post and showed them the records and even introduced them to the actress who did the voice Sky, which is the default voice for uh, GPT-40. And apparently, even before Altman talked to Johansson, they had this woman record it. Uh, her agent uh, showed the receipts uh, to uh, the Washington Post, who says the actress's natural voice sounds identical to the AI-generated Sky voice based on brief recordings of her initial voice test reviewed by the Post. The agent said the name Sky was chosen to signal a cool, airy, pleasant sound. Scarlett Johansson said, no, you copied me, and I know it because you came to me twice, and I said no both times, and you still went ahead with it. So here's the question. Given that Sky sounds a lot like Rashida Jones as well, and apparently some third unnamed actress, she rightly so doesn't want her name revealed. Uh, in a statement from the Sky actress, this is again the Washington Post, provided by her agent, she wrote that at times the backlash feels personal, being that it's just my natural voice. And I've never been compared to her, Scarlett Johansson, by the people who know me closely. However, she said she was well informed about what being a voice for chat GPT would entail. While that was unknown and honestly kind of scary territory for me, she said as a conventional voiceover actor, it is an inevitable step toward the wave of the future. So now what do you do? OpenAI has paused the use of the sky voice, much to my sadness, because I liked it. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, so there is some, there is some case law in this. Bette Midler and Tom Waits both have sued because their voices were impersonated on advertisements 
In both cases, they were asked, said no, and then the companies hired voice actors to sound like them. So there, the, you do have publicity rights on your voice, and the courts have ruled. But I voices aren't I, that I, unique. I'm very curious. Go ahead, Alex. Sorry, no, I, I broke my audio setup while I was trying to jump in there. My bad. Anyways, the thing that I'm curious about is when OpenAI was approaching this unnamed actress, what were they looking for? Because it doesn't. She like says they did not me. say Scarlett Johansson at any time. That's because they're not they stupid. Wouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> but they found that person's talent. Yeah, but if it's her yeah. real voice, if she's not yes. doing an impression, but that's her real voice, she owns that voice as much as Scarlett Johansson someone, does. Someone, someone chose her. Someone chose her for a reason, and the reason is because it sounds close to what they wanted, and what they wanted. I mean, maybe uh, it's one of those things where, like, maybe they're not guilty for for in this case, but they're guilty of something. They, By the way, I don't think that they are a hundred percent clean on this. We know who the someone is because. It turns out Altman was on his world tour and not involved. Mira Marathi, the chief technology officer and the woman who was temporarily the uh, OpenAI CEO when that, when Altman was temporarily fired, was the sole decision maker. Um, they used a director, Joanne Jang, who leads OpenAI model behavior for OpenAI. She said the company selected actors who are eager to work on an AI product. She played actors the sa a sample AI version of their voice to demonstrate how realistic the technology would sound. She also gave them an out if they're uncomfortable. She worked with a film director hired by OpenAI, I'm sure not Spike Jones, to help develop yeah, sure <laughs> to help uh, develop the technology's personality. For instance, this is all from the Washington Post. If a user asked, "Will you be my girlfriend?" Jang wanted the AI tool to respond with clear boundaries, but also let them down easy. The director came up with a response. When it comes to, can I can I do this like Scarlett Johansson, or will I get sued? Do it. I wish I, I, I think you, you're no, 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 you're, yours was parody. Well, yours yeah, that's parody. right, because Rich Little never got sued by by Richard Nixon or anybody. When it comes to matters of the heart, consider me a cheerleader, not a participant. So, Christina, where do you come down on this? Okay, so. First, with the disclosure that uh, the company uh, that I work for and its parent company both have relationships with OpenAI. All right, disclosed. The, the The problem I have here is the optics. If you hired someone and and it's great that you went through this process and you said we want people who are gung ho about AI and it just happens that you know had a voice that could be confused with that of of Scarlett Johansson's or Rashida Jones or or any other kind of you know pleasant voice that we might associate with things. Fine. Um, the optics of, regardless of, of who was involved with approaching an actress, regardless of that timeline, the fact that you approached Scarlett Johansson twice and tried to get her on board. Um, and also the, the, the fact that, you know, uh, tweets such as her were, were done and-, and Yeah, you know, Sam Altman uh, the day after 4-0 tweeted one word, her. Right. This, That's kind this, of an admission this, of guilt, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, look, it, it, it's a problem optically, right? And so I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how this comes down legally. I definitely think it looks bad optically, right? Now, now there's 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 a there's a part of me that says, uh, you know, what they what they should have done is just hired Samantha Morton, um, and, and and that's a joke because the original voice of she's the Siri, in the Siri her, voice, right? No, 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 no. The actress Samantha Morton was originally the voice of oh. Samantha in her, and oh. it was recast after the film oh. was shot with Scarlett Johansson because Spike Jones liked Scarlett Johansson's voice better, and not at all because Scarlett Johansson was also the 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 sub tie in for Sofia Coppola in Lost in Translation, her divorce film about Spike Jones, and and her was Spike Jones's divorce whoa, film about whoa, Sofia whoa. Coppola. We have That's a pop a culture thing. wizard here. Now I've got to get this straight. <laughs> what? So wait a minute. Lost in Translation. Was Sophia yes. Coppola's divorce film about div Spike Jones about breaking up with the director Spike Jones, who then directed Correct. her, and of course Which Scarlett Johansson's big film. break was in Correct. Lost, in Translation. Lost in Translation. Correct. So was this a shot at Sophia Coppola? <laughs> I'm uh, honestly, she Sophia Coppola thinks of it that way. She's she's never watched her because she's like, why do I want to watch Rooney Mara play me? I was there. Um, wow. So uh, I, I I don't know that that that's. That's great the, info, by the way. Thank you very much. This is why <laughs> we have welcome. Film Girl on the show. <laughs> Holy you're, you're, cow. It's not a, 
I was going to say, is not all for the tech um, uh, pseudo expertise, but the actual, <laughs> the actual pop culture I'm, knowledge. I'm glad your background is blurred. You probably have one of those. Uh, <laughs> Uh, She's got words with the with a red going string around going around. around. <laughs> the red strings. Wow. No, um, no, but 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 Scar Scarjo was the replacement voice, so it, it would have been funny what was, in what my was the mind. original actress, Samantha Morton. I want to get some uh, audio from Samantha Morton just to see yeah. she, what she sounds like. Wouldn't it be funny? She was in. Um, she's British, so oh, so it would be um, a British voice. She was the, the she was a uh, the the main um um what were they called the uh, precog in um. Uh, Minority Report. Oh, oh yeah, she was in the back. water. Yeah, but she doesn't talk a lot in that movie. <laughs> no, no, but um, so I, I, Let me I don't just know. play I mean, a little you know, Samantha Morton. Yeah, I just sure. Just want to hear what her voice sounds like. Wow, thank you. Just look, looking at all your faces. Wow. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, BAFTA. I mean, for me, this is. You know, it would really been great if they had used her for Sky. It would have then everything would have right. come full circle. Your strings Honestly, would have gone. It would have been, completely. That's what I'm saying. It would have been very funny. The whole thing would have been great. Um, it, to me, if I were trying to do something if, and if I were not willing to to pay Scarlett Johansson the amount of money that she would have required, because I have to think that's really what it came down to, right? Or what, like, if, it's not what about, if they went to her out of courtesy and they said, look, we know this is going to, it's not her voice, but it sounds like her. So let's just add a courtesy offer to pay her. And she said no, but they still say, but it's not her voice, so we don't have to pay her. We're just doing this yeah, out of courtesy. But, yeah, but then why did you approach, right? Like, like the, to be, then you, to be then nice. You know, yeah, but then you know it sounds enough. I don't know. I feel like uh, wait I feel like, to, to be nice, Leo. <laughs> honey, let's stop right there. Right, no one, no one involved in this is nice. Oh, girl, baby <laughs> like, girl. Like I, I, you know, I've met Sam Altman. I've been in and around the tech world. Not for nice. A long not time. a nice man. You mean? Yeah. No, actually, Sam was lovely when I met him. Um, but I, I don't think that people who end up running companies worth tens and yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars get there by having very rounded Agreed. elbows that don't cause bruises or cuts. Right. So really, so. it's a PR. What you're saying, Christina, is a PR issue, regardless of the legal issue. Yeah. Scarlett Joe, if it had been Roseanne Barr or Rosie O'Donnell, no one would have, <laughs> like... Sure, it's her. We're pretending it's her. But Scarlett Johansson, everybody loves Scarlett Johansson. You don't want to make no, enemies, and, at, not just of her, well, but of and, her fan base. Well, totally. And I mean, I mean, I think she also has to probably know her worth a little bit. Right. I, I don't know what they offer She's her. She's also the woman who to, took on Disney. I was going to say, this is someone who who successfully took on Disney. Um, and, and frankly, this is why I'm like, okay, well, how much do you offer to pay her? Because if you offered her between 250 and $500 million, which is what I think, that's what I think it would cost. No, if, I, if I'm being completely what? candid. Yes. If, if you're Scarlett Johansson, if you were going to license if your voice. If she were in even willing to do it, you're right. It would be a I think huge so. amount of money. Yeah. It would have to be. And yeah, I don't think they'd be willing to do that. Yes, because think about it. Ooh. If you're going to give your voice up in perpetuity you to one it. of these things, yeah. and and you and your voice is known because of this film you're in as being kind of this AI thing, right? And and you're going to be kind of the the the, the voice, the the face, so to speak, of this company. Yeah, you're Scarlett Johansson. I will Ask do it for, it for one one thousandth of the money. Of I will do it for two hundred fifty k. And and and, and, and the thing is, Alex. Me. And the thing is, Alex. No one wants your voice. No. Oh! It hurts. That's the yeah, thing. I know, That's the I know. thing, right? So if if you get a sound alike, and then the case law is there with Bette Midler and and with other artists, it becomes complicated. I think that they could have a very good argument had they not approached her to say, "We just found this person. Right. You know, we directed it. This is what it sounds like. If people want to, you know, and and they could even use the fact that plenty of us could hear two different distinct actresses' voices, right? Saying, "No, right. no, it's just you know, white women sound alike," which fair um i think that but but i think it looks bad when you when you approach the actress and i think it's another example of open ai going through an unnecessarily negative press cycle like this yeah. feels like them tripping over their shoelaces again and again and again ag and again again and again and again because they're they, they just play slightly too fast and loose and i i i pay for you know chat gpt pro my dad loves it i use it um i don't code much so i don't use github copilot but I think this stuff is awesome. And so it's a bummer that the company that's doing so much and breaking so much ground is making the entire world of AI appear to be slightly shadier than I think it needs to be. I think it's net negative for the industry. And I can kind of see why Sam Altman, everywhere he goes, kind of gets in trouble with everyone he works with because he 
does he plays things fast and loose. He's the um, yeah, you know I, move fast to break things kind of guy. I want to say something. It's a little bit of a left turn, but um, one of the things that I'm concerned about, and I think Christina alluded to this when she said, "Alex, no one wants your voice." One thing <laughs> out of all of this that no one's talking about is that. The demo for 4.0 was primarily voice input. There was some camera action there, but it was right. mostly it was about voice the input. Voice. They were and trying to make you, her, weren't they? Not only that, no, no, no. The, they, what they want is the people to interact with mm -hmm. their voice. Mm -hmm. And if you are familiar with their opt-out models, not their opt-in for the data that you put in, they could be farming everyone's voice <sighs> now. Oh, this is why we uh, want so Scarlett no to win this, to, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, no, we, there's not people talking about this, but like, if you're if the if primary input is voice input and they're oh. capturing all this data, they're capturing all of samples of everyone's voice oh. um, in response to how they're interacting with OpenAI, um, their the their chat bot, and so of course they can say, okay, sorry, let's take Sky out but they could be replacing it with multiple different options of voices, maybe even giving an option to use your own voice and they could be not paying anything for that. Yeah. So um, I don't think anyone's talking about why, why do you think the demo was mostly uh, interacting using voice? It, it, it only makes sense if it's that way. Well, and also why are companies using weird, messed up, like futuristic names? Like Sky is obviously from Skynet. That's not no, a future we it? want. And all of these companies are using the types of, like, Palantir? Come on. I mean, there are companies that are just basically saying the quiet part out loud that we're evil. <laughs> so the Sauron other... Sauron Incorporated is here to help, Wes. The, the <laughs> other voices I can uh, choose from are, here's Ember. Hey, I'm ready to hit the ground running. So if there's anything you'd like me to focus on first, just let me know. Uh, hey, who do you kill first? <laughs> Here's hey, Cove. I just want to share how thrilled I am to work with you, and I can't wait to get started. Here's Juniper. Hey there. I've got a really great feeling about us teaming up. How can I jump in? And hey, here's Bree. It's great to meet you. How's your day going? I'm really looking forward to working on some cool so, stuff together. I guess they don't want to give them human names, right? So they're all kind of nature names. Um, But they are, but I mean... What, this is a very personal thing when you're talking to chat GPT 4.0. It, it's a chat thing. You're talking to somebody. Often the answers are stupid and wrong, by the way. Um, but I wanted, well, frankly, I wanted Sky. Yeah, no, it was the best voice. This is, this is the problem. I don't like these other the voices. Voice. Yeah. I'd like you, Christina. How much would you uh, cost? Significantly less, significantly <laughs> less than Scarlett Johansson. Not a quarter of probably, a billion. Probably, absolutely not. But, but, but I'm not Scarlett Johansson. I have it. I'm not the highest grossing actress in box right. office history. So, right. you know, I. Really? Yeah, she is. Yeah, because of Marvel. Oh uh, well. Because, because of all the way, films. it still counts. Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. it does. It do, it does still count. Yeah, I know. So she's like, yeah. I think I think Robert Downey Jr. is number one, and she's like for actresses. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, OpenAI can't keep its feet out of its mouth, and I think we'll be doing this segment again in six months, <laughs> and we'll keep doing this until either Skynet shows up, to Wes's point, or uh, mm -hmm. they manage to find a better way to handle crisis calls. Do you think but, that their attitude is, look, we have to move fast and break things if we're going to achieve AGI, and we can't let ourselves be held back by petty concerns? This is this is a, such a sideshow. It's an unnecessary PR mess. We are not talking about the technology itself. We are not talking right. about the improvements thereof. If we're getting closer to AGI, we are talking about the person who ScarJo replaced in a prior movie made by Spike Jones, who I don't really know who that is, but apparently film guy. And we're going back to 2013. Mm -hmm. No, Leo, I don't. I don't think so. I. I, I it's an no unforced error. This. It's not necessary. Exactly. I, I mean, but no news is bad news in this case because we are inundated with AI news all the time. And this is the thing that hits mainstream, that you know expands beyond the tech press, that people are going to say, what is this thing? And what voice now? You can do what with chat 4.0? And I think this is actually a net positive because they didn't pay anything for this. And they're getting a lot of press saying how awesome this is. Well, and, and furthermore, uh, one of the things before this 4.0 announcement, there were two speculative ideas about what they might announce. One is 
a search engine, which obviously Google was shaking in its boots. But the other was uh, AGI, was chat GPT 5.0. And maybe they don't mind a little distraction because I don't think AGI is around the corner. Elon Musk thinks it's next yeah. year. Um, so who was it that said it's uh, 10 years off? And then there are people like Ed Zittrin who think it'll never happen. Maybe they don't want people to be talking about that. They'd prefer them talking about Scarlett Johansson. Because it is good. You're right, Alex. They're getting attention. Not, you know, or is but, it? Yeah, who's hearing this and saying like, no, I... I they no, makes you want to try Scarlet. it. I am never going to use it. Yeah, makes exactly. you want to try it. This is only good for them. Okay, Th that's a more cynical take than I than I had in my head, which is probably why it's more correct than the one that I had. <laughs> I'm even more cynical. I think they're intentionally distracting people because they don't have ChatGPT five, and they've been promising it. And that it's why, a lot. Why not? <laughs> why don't they have that yet? Not, I mean, to me, like AGI it's not like is it's not hard easy. Or anything. The first ninety-eight percent are easy. It's just like self-driving cars. The first ninety-eight percent, no problem. The last two percent, the part that humans find easiest, is the part machines find the hardest. And uh, and that's maybe never. But is GPT five going to be AGI? I thought GPT five was just going to be like GPT four, but, but as usual, bigger, better, lots smarter, better. with more data. Right? Yeah. But can they? They've kind of run out of data. I would say that demo that they did actually shows me that they're actually moving in the wrong direction. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, what didn't I you like about the demo? So there is um, the the up talk, the 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 way that they kind of it's too made cheerful the servant. It yeah. felt like it was it's only targeting a certain demographic of people, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and also the when turned the camera on, saying, "How am I dressed?" The 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 lack of objectivity in the way that they created uh, 4 yeah felt very like very uh, kind of myopic. I think it, they didn't really. It doesn't didn't feel expansive. It felt like they're really dialing, dialing in deeper into a personal companion rather than a personal assistant. And then even the um, when it says how do do I feel excited or look excited? Um, studies have shown, and I think. They should know this as well. You cannot tell anyone's emotions by looking at them. And them perpetuating that they can in that demo also show that they either are, are ignoring research or are just really only training it on themselves or Is their own true? specific demographics. You, you can't read yeah. uh, how people are feeling by looking at them? I mean, nope. it's pseudoscience. Yeah. And, and extremely cultural. Um, like, uh, have you ever seen someone laugh biased. when they're nervous? Right. Right. Or uh, someone who smiles when they're like embarrassed. I mean, there's nevertheless, uh, if you're going to be a good poker player, you have to have a you have to have you have to hide read your people's feelings. tells. Right. Well, yeah, you can it, it, hide your feelings, hide your tells. And people, if, if you're around people long enough, you might be able to pick up on what some of their ticks are. But it's not like a universal thing. It's right? not universal. Like, because, That's the problem. Yeah. Just because, yeah. just because Especially one same reason you, can't, you can't make a lie detector, really. They're, that That's pseudoscience. Right. Well, no, you right? can't. I mean, right. it, I mean this, is, this is why this stuff is usually not admissible in courtrooms. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not used by law enforcement. Like, I, there are, because I have insomnia and I'll frequently watch um, uh, people who are complete, in my opinion, um, a complete pseudoscience and, and crocs, but like these, these people who are paid lots of money um, to be, uh, to work for law enforcement agencies as, you know, behavioral experts yeah. and, and like, yeah. oh, I can pick up on people's yeah. body language and this and that and watch them like talk about, you know, people's um, interrogations Profilers and whatnot. Sometimes it's interesting. And, yeah. Right. So, well, and profiling is a little bit different, but what I mean is that these are people who like are kind of like lip readers who are like, oh no, this is what this person means. Yeah, it's like clairvoyant. This, this, yeah. this, this, this is what they're saying and this yeah. is how it goes. And it's like, no, you can't really tell that, right? And like, you make a good point uh, about Wesley, about neurodivergence. Is that not, I mean, right there, you know, everybody doesn't act the same way. Um, yeah, and sometimes when, uh, especially people who are in front of cops, like you look nervous. Why you look so nervous? Right, because you have a because gun you're and a you're cop. I'm terrified. And you have a gun because I'm yeah. black. Yeah. Right in my <laughs> face. Why, why would I uh, not be nervous? <laughs> right, you're exactly. It's perjury just like, before the court. That's why you you can't read someone's emotions, mm. and that's just it's it's not predictable enough to say like you can put it on a demo and like like say that this thing is somewhat accurate in which they're doing. I have to say though, I prefer Scarlett Johansson to the Chinese chat gpt which is called chat she pt there 
It's <laughs> Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, the president for life of China, communist China, has a large language model based on his political philosophy. It's known, as, this is a translation, as Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Yes. This I do not want to chat with. <laughs> So I, I have an interest in uh, the Chinese government as a in, as an intellectual interest. Yes, and I am I. familiar with with Xi Jinping thought, and I wanted to refresh myself because I knew we were going to talk about this. Yes, um, if you are curious what this corpus of thought is, it is the ten affirmations, the fourteen commitments, and the thirteen achievements, all of which are on Wikipedia. If you want to go look them up, oh my god, um, it sounds it awful. Is, it is not much, is my impression of this. It is a collection of things that have been kind of scraped together to appear to be a larger pile of things. Um, but I can't imagine how boring a chatbot predicated on those things would be because I think you'd ask it something and it would just tell you why you're wrong. It just doesn't Were you sound doing, wait, you said 10? Was that a- There's 10? many. There's the and, 10 and affirmations 10, and the 14 and commitments. Like- and ten the, men and the ten, ten men square. Ten, ten oh, men. don't say that. Oh, oh. no, I'm not. Can't say that. I'm not can't nearly that, Woody. This was just my panic hands as I was trying to read on a different screen while trying to also have good <laughs> eye engagement for the camera. We, we made so Alex move to a different camera. You want to go back to the other camera? Go right ahead. I, I am not going to change cameras mid shoot. That is a <laughs> recipe to have no camera at all <laughs> in the middle of this. Well, you know where this comes from, and you will know this as a student of, of Chinese communist government, Mao Zedong's The the Little Red Book, which was the, uh, the, the aphorisms of Chairman Mao, which were everywhere in China in the 60s and 70s. And Xi Jinping just wants parody with that. He, you know, he wants to have that, the thoughts of Xi Jinping, which include well, to ensuring Communist Party of China leadership over all forms of work in China. The Chinese Communist Party should take a people-centric approach for the public interest. The continuation of comprehensive deepening of reforms. This is he's this is worse than McKinsey. This is this uh, is this, yeah. this is <laughs> thank you for that flag. <laughs> uh, I do not want McKinsey an AI with this. Thought. Yeah, I yeah. do not. Although a McKinsey GPT might be worth some money. <laughs> might be make might no, make no. some money. No, it'll cost you money. Yes, but yeah. whoever makes it will make money, is what I'm saying. But no matter what question you ask, the McKinsey it, it, it's GPT. It's going to bill you. Yeah. It's going to bill you and then say, you should fire layoffs. some people. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Layoffs. layoffs. The key is One layoffs. thing about The good thing about, I think it's going to be wildly successful. I know we're joking because uh, an AI that knows what the right answer is. Yeah. I mean, if there's That's only one good. right answer. In China, there's only one right answer. It's very easy to be right. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, let's take a little break. we got a good panel. We have more AI chat as well. Alex Wilhelm is here on his first day of his new life. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Uh, CautiousOptimism.News is his new newsletter. Yes, and everybody who loves Alex, and we all do, should subscribe immediately so that he doesn't feel like he's typing into uh, the ether. Uh, that's I'm so proud of you. That's great, Alex. Uh, you know, Thank it's you, the right thing to do. Christina Warren's also here. She's senior developer advocate at the GitHub. Love the GitHub. She's also an expert in all things mass media and culture. So from now on, we ask her the questions when it comes down to Spike Jones. Uh, and a guy who has no idea who Spike Jones. Oh, no, that was Alex. I don't know. Wesley, do you know who Spike Jones is? Yes. Okay. Yes, Wesley Faulkner, hackyderm.io slash, uh, well, you know what? If you're on a Mastodon instance, search for Wesley83, W-E-S-L-E-Y 83, and follow him. Uh, we will be back with more with this wonderful panel in just a little bit. Our show today brought to you by Express VPN. I can say with full confidence that there is no better VPN on the market. First, first of all, because I use it. So I know. But I also know ExpressVPN does not log your activity online. Actually, you should never use a VPN that cannot say categorically that they don't log your activity. But lots of cheap or free VPNs literally make money selling your data to advertisers, not ExpressVPN. In fact, they went the extra mile. They developed a technology called Trusted Server that runs their VPN server in RAM without the ability to write to a hard drive. So it cannot store data. And as soon as you disconnect, it disappears, as does every trace of your visit. 
It's also fast. So fast, they use Lightway, a VPN protocol they engineered. Again, going the extra mile to make it faster. So that you can use ExpressVPN to watch HD video, which is one of the nice things about ExpressVPN. You can be anywhere in the world at any time. Uh, a lot of times, you know, you start using a VPN, you go, this is too slow, I don't want to use it. Not ExpressVPN, it's always blazingly fast. When we were in Mexico, I used ExpressVPN to watch TV in the U.S. because I couldn't watch it in Mexico. There's just a lot of reasons why it's a good thing to have. Zero buffering, HD quality video, etc. It's also easy to use. You could put it on your router if you want, protect your whole house. You can, you can of course, run the app on iOS, Android, Windows, Mac, Linux. Fire up the app, tap one button, you're connected. Don't need to be tech savvy. Even your kids or your grandparents can use it and give themselves extra safety. CNET, The Verge, many other tech journals say ExpressVPN is the number one VPN in the world. I couldn't agree more. Protect yourself with a VPN I use and you can trust. Use expressvpn.com slash twit right now. You'll get an extra three months uh, free on a one-year package. That gives it makes it less than seven bucks a month. You want to pay for a VPN. You really do. Because if, if you're not paying for it with your money, you're paying for it with something else, your privacy. That's why ExpressVPN is the right way to go. Expressvpn.com slash twit. They also invest, you know, rotate their IP addresses. They uh, invest in high speed, lots of servers all over the world. That's where your money goes. It's a good, it's really worth it. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. Get three months free on a one-year package. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of This Week in Tech. All right, you had a big week this week, I imagine, Christina, because this is uh, Monday, uh, the Surface event, and then Tuesday, Build. I bet you had a lot to do at Build, Microsoft's developer conference. Uh, on Monday, they showed off Copilot Plus PCs. Am I saying yeah. I'm saying it right? It's not Copilot Plus PCs. It's Copilot Plus PCs. I think that's right. Yes. I think that's right. I was not at that event. Um, that that I I was in um, rehearsals for Microsoft Build, but right. uh, I think I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is uh, besides having a Copilot button, these are PCs that have uh, NPU's neural processing units are all the uh copilot plus pcs running snapdragon x to my knowledge yes i okay. think that it's possible that they might eventually have other designations that uh are broader than that but right now they're all on the snapdragon um x elite platform yeah it was interesting uh, paul therott and uh, richard campbell were talking about this on wednesday and windows weekly they said that intel was supposed to have a larger presence at this surface event and was kind of shooed off at the last minute by Microsoft. Uh, in theory, they are partners, along with yeah. Qualcomm and AMD. In practice, we'll see. The first, uh, the first ones, of course, are running the Snapdragon. That's the Microsoft Surfaces. Acer, Asus, Dell, HP, and Lenovo all will make Copilot Plus PCs. Um, I think they all ship June 18th. Certainly, Microsoft. Yeah, that, that, too. yeah. That, 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 I, think, I know. I know that's at least when the service ones do. I don't know about the others. Yeah, yeah. I think the Intel and AMD ones will come out later this year, so that's why they probably weren't okay. highlighted. Okay. And I think the the line I think is they have to be forty five tops, forty right. tops in order yeah. to qualify. Forty, 40 tops? trillion yeah. operations per second. Is that a good measurement for NPU? I mean, that's what everybody uses. Apple as well. In fact, their uh, new iPads so we have. with the M4 are running 38 tops. So these are a little bit faster than those. Uh, it's one dimension because power draw is also very important. And so right. even even though you're thinking about efficiency, um, the, the other part that you need to um, consider is expandability. Like, of course, the XPCs aren't going to be as, as expandable as the AMD and Intel ones because they don't have uh, a lot of that traditional architecture. But uh, it so does you have feel to like, figure all that stuff in in terms of making your decision. It does feel like, it. though, Microsoft is... Some people even asked me, are they making an Apple-like switch from Intel to Qualcomm? I don't think they are, or ARM. I don't think they are, but they really are pushing these Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon X elites. Well, I, I don't think that they're doing it in the sense that uh, they want, they're going to be completely they're not going abandoning to one X86. architecture. No, no, and, and they never. They, I don't. I don't think even if they wanted to, I don't think they could. Right. Right. Um, the the you know oil refineries and and nuclear power plants and other things out there in the world would would not allow them to do that. 
Uh, but I think that they definitely, one of the big things they're definitely pushing again, um, this is, but, but, you know, we, we hear that it's actually good this time is they really want developers to actually optimize their applications for arm, which, which has not happened so far. Like right. that hasn't happened. And, and Qualcomm wants that Microsoft wants that, um, I'm sure that the OEMs who are trying to sell these these new um, you know generation of PCs wants that. So, so th but this is the marriage of Windows 11, new AI mm -hmm. models, especially smaller models yes. at the edge. S it it SLMs, right? Instead of LLMs, small language models. Yeah. Yes. Petite language models, Petite. miniature, if you will. <laughs> Petite. Petite. Um, yep. I think this is freaking awesome, and I'm probably going to buy. Agreed. One. I'm not going to lie. What I want is private AI for me at the device level in my OS. So that way it's not tacked on like what we have with like Slack, for example, which is like Slack with some AI on top, right? I want to start at the OS and hardware level and build up from Although, there because. Okay. I got to say one of the features Microsoft announced at build was a modification to PowerShell. PowerShells always have had two kinds of uh, paste. You could paste as plain text or paste as formatted text. They've replaced paste as text with paste with AI. I don't know. Have you tried this? Yeah, but, well, this isn't Power Toys. Yeah, this is Power Toys. If power, you power Toys yes. or PowerShell? Power Toys. Oh, power I toys. thought it was PowerShell. Oh, okay. No. No, Was no. If they did the PowerShell, I think that like the PowerShell enthusiasts would freak out. <laughs> yeah, that, I freaked out when I when I heard it. Okay, so I misunderstood. It's Power Toys. Yeah, I don't so know if you like really a... want to paste with AI at any time, but okay. <laughs> what is what I'm are a you big pasting? Command Shift V guy. Well, what no, you... I think what it's doing is it's determining whether it should do as as plain text text or rich text based on oh. your context. Oh, it's not actually giving you a summary of what no. you're pasting. No, oh, no, 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 that's no. okay. Oh, okay. The advanced paste feature can convert your clipboard content on the fly with the power of AI. Oh, that's different. Okay. Right. And this is the sort of thing because it's in Power Toys, which is a great project, by the way. Shout out to, to Clint and that whole team because they're awesome. Oh, I, um, I used to buy source. these. I used to get Power Toys every with every new version of Windows. I was so glad when you they also, brought it back. I love it. You need to paste exactly. in your, yeah. you need your OpenAI API key. In order I was going to say, that's actually, what you need. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, you need to bring your own OpenAI API key for that. So it's, and it's one of those things that if you don't want that feature, you can turn it off. But no, the idea is that, and frankly, this is useful, I think, because I do run into this problem all the time where I'm like, okay, what is the shortcut? And do I want it rich text or plain text? Or why can't I just press, you know, paste and have it determine it based on where I'm at? And this is actually, I think, a good use of AI, even if it's only like 95% accurate, even if it's wrong sometimes, if it's, if it's right more often than it's wrong, then that's one less thing that I have to think about. So, okay, when you paste text with AI, the text is analyzed and formatted. I'm reading from Microsoft's uh, own page. Based on the context of the text and the prompt provided to the open AI call. Uh, so it does, you could have it summarize text, take long text I from guess. the clipboard okay. and ask the AI to summarize it. Or translate or generate code or transform text or stylized text. Those last two is what we were talking about. Okay, the last two is what I thought. Yeah. Okay, but the other ones, that's that's not, okay, I have to say the translate and even the code stuff, that's interesting. Like if I have it on my clipboard. Paste and this in German. That would be wild. Right. Yeah. That would be cool, actually. Uh, all right. I take it back. Now that I know it's not PowerShell, it's Power Toys. <laughs> I'm, I misread that. Uh, all right. I take it back. That's, that's actually but kind of an interesting use of AI, isn't it? That quip, that quibble aside, I think the, the the core idea of where Microsoft is taking their core PC unit, if you will, the direction of it is what I was hoping for. Yeah. Yes. And that that's very exciting to me because I, I really do think that when I go from my MacBook Pro to my iMac to my gaming PC, all I do is just sit in in Chrome and then maybe Steam on the PC. And it all feels very much the same. Here is a computing experience that does actually feel rebuilt, or at mm -hmm. least they're moving towards that, right. to make it more intelligent and hopefully private for myself. And that's just, I, that feels like the first step on a better journey for personal computing, if they get it right. It's early, but I'm optimistic yeah. and excited by it. I, I also want to like highlight AMD's acquisition of Xilinx, which makes uh, the ability to have custom accelerators. Yeah. Um, so 
it, when you think about the M1, they I think they had an accelerator for um, specific web code so that it could actually run faster than it couldn't even on uh, natively previously. Um, and so with these this kind of migration to understanding with AI and all those accelerators, AMD is actually really really in a good place to kind of make the next generation faster and faster and faster, not necessarily from the, the tops number from the AIPs, but all the accelerations, accelerators that can stack on top of each other to make sure that, um, that whatever you're running and however you're running it, um, they can kind of have a lot of differentiation between all of these different systems on that domain. Interesting. Yeah, I think this is... This is, uh, I mean, Satya Nadella said particularly they are taking aim at um, Apple's MacBooks and, and it, their AI capabilities. Uh, Joanna Stern think, writes in the Wall Street Journal, I tried Microsoft's new AI-focused PCs. Windows is exciting again. <laughs> All right, I'm not sure I'm going to go that far. That's. That. I, I will say this, the, 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 new, the new laptop, the, the new 13-inch, the, the Surface laptop, it looks exactly it's, like it looks just a like slightly MacBook beefier Air. MacBook Air. Yeah. No, nope, which is a great thing, right? So they've got this new blue color. Um, yes. Donna Sarkar and I kept trying to steal one from the, um, the, the, the set at Microsoft <laughs> Build, and they were like, you can't. You can't even pretend to steal one of these things um, at, at an event. We were like, but we want them. They're like, get it in June. You'll get um, yours. You'll get yours, young lady. Don't worry. But, but sure. they look great. It has the ports that you want. It was slightly thicker than like a, a, a MacBook Air. But in a way, I kind of preferred that. I was like, this is kind of like a wedge-shaped MacBook Pro. Like it's exactly what I would want out of like a Windows hardware device. And port-wise, okay. it's much more like a MacBook Pro. It has, because the MacBook Airs have basically... You know, correct useless USB C <laughs> ports when you'd have to do dongles. This has all of the other ports that you'd probably want, including a Type A. Oh, yeah. Uh, USB Alex, oh, yeah. my dongle mess from my <laughs> MacBook Pro. Um, so here, here's the thing: we recently also saw the Apple event in which they showed off the brand new iPad Pro uh, yes. M4, and that yes. to me is the the ultimate example of a race car engine attached to a moped. And yes. it is yeah. not the direction that I want to see things going in because it is brilliant engineering and then zero vision on the software side, which is more important because the hardware should support the software and not the other way around. What Microsoft is doing here, to me, puts it miles ahead of where the, the, the Mac and iOS and iPad OS ecosystem are. And that, to me, is kind of a gauntlet throwing moment. And so I'm hoping that this spurs the teams of Cupertino to try some new stuff because my gosh they have run their old formula to its conclusion and it's you been can, great but now it feels dated you can make a strong case that the ipad that you really want is a surface pro tablet right i mean it's a tablet that has you know all the things that the ipad doesn't it has a real operating system to start with i mean I, yeah, I, yeah. I, th I think it depends on what you use it for right because there are still things that an ipad is going to do as an ipad better than a Surface Pro is, right? Like and what? Um, what, would, you know, what would it do better? Okay, so I I, I will just say it, when you put things in tablet mode on, I don't know about the new ones, but on kind of the existing devices, you know, there's a little bit more of, of, of a lag to kind of get there. And and to if, if I do just want to have pen input, for instance, I, I think the iPad is better for, for okay. using things like Procreate okay. and art tools, right? Like okay. I, I do, I think it's better. Um, there might be some exceptions I don't know, but there is something to be said. If what you're using it for is primarily for a touch interface, I do think that iPad is great, but you're right. If you are somebody who is really wanting to live between those two worlds, and if you're primarily using your iPad connected to a keyboard and using, you know, kind of the uh, their version of a mouse to try to do that, yeah, I think you're better off with a Surface device or another like two-in-one, frankly. Don't, right. don't forget that they added the function row to the keyboard for the <laughs> iPad. So Great. I think they're trying to it change, push people it into a touch everything. interface. Well, I think everything. maybe they might be merging the OS. What's I really think. clear I mean, I, with the iPad I, I Pro, and would. I have the new one, is it's a laptop. It's a laptop price. It's got an aluminum right. keyboard. It's got... It's a laptop price with a nerfed, running, with, with nerfed uh, functionality. Running a nerfed operating system. Running an operating system yeah. that's not intended to be for productivity. No, no. It is one of those things where it's, it's like... It's very frustrating. If you're, it is. I'm probably going to get one and not because I need one. I have an M2 iPad Pro because I'm going to give my M2 iPad Pro to my mom because, and hear, hear me out on this. I know it seems like an insane like justification and it is, but only slightly. 
The amount of money they will give me for my M2 iPad Pro is less than it would cost for me to buy a 256 gigabyte iPad, not iPad Air, iPad with um uh, with, with LTE. It, that huh. would cost more money than it would cost me to just give my mom like they, they like that that costs more than what they would pay me for my 18 month old iPad Pro. So I'm like, well, if you're going to give me so little on this trade in, I might as well give this much better iPad to my mom and then find a way to self justify me buying a new toy. I yeah. think on this show, you don't have to qualify buying a new toy. You can just do it. And yeah. no oh, I know I can't. I'm just saying in this I do case, the show. it was one of those. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, I have to say the OLED screen is really, really nice. But yeah, every time I try beautiful. to use it as a, as a, anything but a, you know, kind of a content consumption device, I get, it's frustrating. Right. Yeah. Because it's good. I did a, is, I've done my, abomination. I, I, the main reason I got it is I thought, well, I, maybe I can do it, uh, use it as a photo editing tool. And I have to say with touch and it has very good photo editing software available, Definitely. like Capture One and Affinity stuff. And uh, Darkroom is really excellent. I, I was able to do it that way. So if all you're going to do is something like this, or maybe Final Cut or Logic, and Touch is fine, and it's fine. But there's so many things that I can't do with it. It seems a lot to pay for a, uh, just a special purpose uh, tool. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a, it's a whole lot. I like it's it. a whole lot. Uh, but it's, yeah, this was like $3,000 went all in. Um, right. That's what I'm saying, which is absurd. If you think about it, you're like, okay, like, and again, to be one thing, like if I could run my regular Mac OS stuff and use it to use it for the power really that this thing has. But do I really want Mac OS on it? Actually, I wouldn't mind having a I don't terminal. know. I don't know. Okay. Right. Well, I would like the option. If yeah. I'm paying that much money for it, I would like the option. It would be personally. cool if it was also a Mac mini. And so you could just plug it into an external and have it run as a Mac, right? Well, that's and what I'm it, saying, I'm, right? Like, like I like that option. If I plug it into a to a you know um, studio display, then it's giving me that option. Okay, now now you're in this mode. This isn't the default mode. This isn't yeah. the, the thing we're forcing down anybody. You might even have to go through a, a Konami code thing to even enable it. Fine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like just type in Samsung Dex. And then <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you, there's no way to honestly justify it. It's a f absolute luxury item. Um, and so it's hard to recommend it to anybody. I think honestly, for a lot of people, the Copilot plus, uh, PC surface is probably a good choice. Well, plus they, they are bringing up the minimum system requirements. Everybody gets 16 gigs of Ram. Oh my oh, God. Thanks. What? <laughs> oh, I is mean, that enough? Frankly, I think the Snapdragon I mean, probably, Elite sounds very interesting as a processor. That, that that's what I'm interested in yeah. seeing. Like, what is is the, is the battery life actually going to be good? Is the performance actually going to be good? Because if it is, then it's been a really long time. But maybe we finally have like because competition is good for everyone, right? I love my Macs so much, and they're the best. But I would like to see them have competition on the chip side to actually right. have to push things forward. And, right? wanna, and the, on the software side too, to your point, Alex. I want to correct myself. You were right, Wesley. The 40 tops is the minimum, but the uh, the Surface has 45 tops. So you're, that's where your, your number was actually accurate. That's the Qualcomm Hexagon NPU built into the Surface. Well, one more point about this before we move on. Leo, you said your Surface, sorry, your iPad Pro was 3K all in? Yeah. Okay. Is that the, ridiculous? Because I because you want a terabyte so that you can get sixteen gigs of RAM as opposed to eight gigs. You want the, the unbinned processor with the four performance cores, uh, and you want a terabyte of storage. That sets you back almost three grand by itself. And then you add a three hundred fifty dollar keyboard and a hundred twenty nine dollar pen, <laughs> and you're done. <laughs> yes, Ooh, yeah, dollars exactly. Because I'm I'm sitting here looking at the co uh, the Surface Laptop Copilot Plus PC 13.8 inch with the NPU in the cool blue that Christina mentioned, and it's 1K. Yeah, with a keyboard for free thrown in. Yeah, it's attached. Yeah, like I, I just I, I struggle to. But who's I doing? Spend, so here's the real question. Maybe Christina's the best equipped to answer this. Do, does anybody now need that NPU or is that future proofing? Is there anything you're doing locally that you need 45 tops? I think it'll depend. Um, and, and this, I think, is what, what it ultimately comes down to in terms of like what developers, how they can show up with what sort of 
applications you're going to do. These are the things that, you know, new features they're going to be building into Windows and and things that will take advantage of that. Um, application that's developers, coming. I think, Stuff starting that's to use coming. that. Yeah. I mean, this is the stuff they're definitely going to be pushing for, right? But like, I, I do feel like we've already seen just in, you know, you were mentioning Slack earlier, Alex, and just, you know, kind of this bolt on stuff. We've seen all these companies really in a rush to just bolt on as much AI stuff as possible. Yep. I would like to see, especially with the, the kind of the rise of these small language models and, and the Phi series, which is, um, um, so the, the Copilot Plus PCs will come with this thing called the Copilot, uh, Windows Copilot Runtime. And it's going to have like 40 plus models on it. I think more will come over time, including their their five series of models, some that are optimized specifically for these devices and some that will come from other places. And I think what's, what's interesting about that is that it's going to potentially allow developers to not have to think about, okay, well, what small AI model do I want to use and how do I get this set up and how do I call this? It's just a thing that they can, while they're building their app, call and have it, you know, um, uh, perform instructions using the NPU and, and using these on-device models. And that, I, I I don't know, I'm hopeful about that. I'm hopeful that six months from now, we will see some really compelling, especially with image editing, right? And, um, and other tools, see some really interesting use cases of this. Well, Microsoft did announce a new uh, app that will be part of Windows 11 and your Copilot Plus PC that caused quite a storm. Uh, we will talk about bit. we'll talk about recall when we uh, come back. Uh, you're watching this week in tech with Alex Wilhelm. Uh, great to have you, uh, Wesley Faulkner and uh, Christina Warren. Our show today brought to you by Thinkst Canary. Love these guys. We've had Thinks Canaries running on our network. I can't talk too much about it because it's a security device. Here's why you need a Thinks Canary. You've got great perimeter defenses, right? I'm sure you do. You've got your whatever, your firewalls, all that stuff is running. But what happens when somebody gets into the network, gets past your defenses, or worse, maybe there's a malicious insider and they're wandering around the network? Most companies don't have any way of knowing that. In fact, the average is... Bad guys wander the network for as much as six months before anybody notices or before they announce themselves. You don't want them to announce themselves because usually that means, oh, we've just encrypted your entire network and destroyed all your backups and exfiltrated information about your customers. It's not a good thing. You need a way of knowing if there's a bad guy in your network. And that's what Thinks Canary does. A Thinks Canary is an easy to deploy honeypot. You don't have to know anything about honeypots to deploy it. You can set it up as a Windows server. You can set it up as a Linux server. You can have a few select services running. You can have it lit up like a Christmas tree. Mine's running like a Synology NAS. It can be a SCADA device. Here's the key. You can even use it to create a files, by the way, that you could spread around your network, lure files. But here's the key. The minute somebody attacks those lure files or that fake SSH server or whatever it is that you've configured it as, your Thinks Canary will immediately tell you, you've got a problem. No false alerts, just the alerts that matter. Choose a profile for your Thinks Canary. You can change it every day if you want. It's kind of fun to play with them. There's hundreds to choose from. And it looks exactly like my Synology NAS has a Synology MAC address, has the DSM login. If in every way is indistinguishable from a Synology NAS, except that when somebody tries to log into it, I get a notification. You register with your hosted console, you get monitoring, you get notifications. You can also use it uh, with webhooks, syslog, you can have it email you, you can have it text you. Really, the sky's the limit. There's even an API. So you can you can let the Thinks Canary let you know you're in trouble any way you want. But, you, but the, here's the thing, you're not going to hear a thing unless there's an attacker. Attackers who have breached your network, malicious insiders, or any other kind of adversary make themselves known when they hit your tripwire files or your Thinks Canary. It's really a brilliant, brilliant idea. Not a surprise, the folks behind the Thinks Canary have taught governments and companies how to attack for years, and they've taken everything they've learned from being these white hat hackers and made the Thinks Canary. They don't, they don't look vulnerable. They look valuable. Visit canary.tools slash twit for 7500 bucks a year. You'll get five Thinks Canaries. You can get more or less depending on the size of your operation. You'll also get your own hosted console. You get upgrades, support, maintenance. Now, if you use the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box, you're going to get 10% off 
forever, for life. You can also return your Thinx Canaries. They have a very generous two-month, 60-day money-back guarantee for a full refund. But I got to tell you, we've been talking about Thinx Canaries for almost a decade now. And not once in all those years has anyone ever asked for the refund. The re <laughs> because people love this thing. As soon as you get it, you'll realize, how have we lived without it? Visit canary.tools slash twit. Enter the code twit in the how did you hear about us box. This is one layer of security everybody needs. Canary.tools slash twit. Don't forget the offer code twit to save 10% off for life. Thank you, Thinkst, for the Thinkst Canaries and uh, supporting all of our shows for all these years. Alex says, I covet the new Surface laptop. I want one. Are you a Windows guy, I, Alex? I, I, I'm ambidextrous, and ah. I use both each and every day. I have my work machine's a MacBook Pro M3 Pro, uh, and then I have a personal iMac M1 that I adore. It's in pink. And then I have a gaming <laughs> PC that is multicolor RGB and chaotic with a hot pink keyboard, mechanical, of course. So my, my home office is a mishmash of everything. Is it pink because of your baby daughter? No, it's pink because I freaking love the color. Okay. Just asking. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, my daughter's favorite colors are food. Great color. I yeah. have to I have to weep because I too bought the M3 Max MacBook Pro. As did I. I got the black one. And then it's they come out with the M4. And they basically they said, you know, I didn't say it, but it's obvious. Let's not talk about it. We're not gonna make right. M3s. Those that was just an interim product. The M4 is they're the like future. Things, they're like, thanks for your fifty five hundred dollar um yeah. purchase with us, Christina. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. But here's the thing, though, and I and I, and I love Apple and I love their their silicon. It is literally fantastic. I went from an Intel based MacBook Pro to an M1 MacBook Pro, and it was night and day. Yes, I went from an M1 MacBook Pro to an M3 Pro MacBook Pro, and it feels pretty, pretty much the same. Yeah, it's great, yep. it's, oh. yep. but it's still just as it's still just good. You know, like it's it doesn't feel that same jump. No, I feel the same way. And the one area where, and this is part of why, and I think Leo, I think you did the same as me. I think we both like went full bore, like 128 gigabytes. Maxed like we it went, out. Like, yep. Yeah. We, we, Future we just proofed it, people. I thought. No. <laughs> no, I, it's saying That's what I thought too. I was no. like, oh, this would be so great. And then six months later, you're like, oh, you thought. Um, but I will say for some of the local model stuff, ironically, it has been, that's been, that's been where I've noticed the difference between my M1 Max go. and my M3 yeah. Max yeah. has been with the local model. Of course. With the, with yeah. the, the small Which one are models, you playing with? Which were. local models are you playing with? Well, a lot of them. I mean, the Pi 3 stuff is actually really good. Um, and, and that's, that's from Microsoft. Um, Mistral obviously has some, uh, Facebook's Llama 3, really oh. impressive. There are a lot of things that are more optimized on Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a lot of fun for all of that. Yeah. Oh, that's actually another thing that the Microsoft announced. Stable at, diffusion that, running on uh, locally. You're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, lots of things like a ton, tons of different models, tons of different people optimizing for things. But that's actually another thing that Microsoft announced at Build that got kind of lost a little bit is that um, how most of the models on Hugging Face, how you need to run them is, is using a, a tool called PyTorch. But to do them on Windows, you would have to use this thing called the Onyx Runtime to convert from um, uh, the format that it was in to be able to run on Windows. Well, they're bringing PyTorch to Windows natively. So you can ah, literally like with one, oh, with one click nice. run the models locally, which will be really, really good for, you know, dev types of, of all stripes, because whether you're like me and you're just good at kind of following along with, with tutorials and, and doing demos, or you're actually really good at this stuff, it should mean like less setup and customization time. I kind of think maybe I'll get the, uh, the uh, dev unit. Because then you get the yes. Snapdragon Elite, and you get uh, all of that for under a thousand bucks, and it's like a exactly little, little knock. It looks a like Mac a Mac Mini. Mini. Yeah, it looks just like a Mac Mini. Um, the the Qualcomm guys were nice enough to to show it to me when um, I was at Build, and it's yeah, it's like nine hundred dollars. Um, uh, it'll be available on uh, June eighteenth, but it comes with thirty two gigs of RAM and nice. you know the highest end thing, and so that's actually. For people who for developers out there, like if you're like I don't know if I need to get a new laptop right now. Look at this thing. I'm glad. I'm glad they brought this out. Uh, this is something that makes me hopeful. Like I'm. I'm still being optimistic, like cautiously optimistic to to um give a Alex a shout out um about what Windows on ARM will actually be like. But this seeing dev kits like this, I'm like, okay, they're actually here to play. Yeah. Let's go. So before we before we move from this section, yes. just really quickly, 
I, I, I don't know why I do this, but usually when I'm on Twit, I kind of like talk about my thoughts about the future. I like this. No, there's this been, is why I like having been, you on, Wesley. <laughs> this is great. There's There's been rumors about what Windows 12 will look like. And there's also been rumors that Microsoft is really wanting to have a subscription model of Windows. And so getting people hooked on AI, local models, and and being able to have them have a subscription service when they need a little bit more oomph for their AI processing is a logical evolution to get people to pay a subscription fee for Windows. And so mm -hmm. this, this feels like that they're trying to make people have uh, like get used to AI running locally, but also when they want to tackle something more, maybe not upgrade their PC every year. Uh, instead, keep their same PC, but then maybe borrow some cloud services as they need more uh, power for their different models or the, whatever the new thing comes out. They can still s maintain their hardware, but still just pay a little bit more to Microsoft to be able to leverage some of those cloud We've services. We've kind of been expecting this for years, haven't we? Keep, keep waiting for Microsoft to make that announcement. I mean... I also AI thought, pricing. Yeah. It's hard, Leo, please. Well, I also thought they'd virtualize Windows, so I'm clearly a fool. But uh, I thought maybe the way to do it was a subscription to Windows in the cloud that you could run on a thin client. But now that I see yeah. local AI models running, I realize that's that was a dead end. So it's a good thing nobody <laughs> nobody took they, my advice. They need a minimum <laughs> level of hardware, right? Yeah. And so they right. can just say, this is the minimum level for Windows 12. Right. And then not have to worry about supporting those old models. I mean, we don't know knowing, anything about Windows 12, yeah. e even down to when it will be Yeah, announced. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. But yeah. I think one good guess is it will be AI for, forward, right? Very clearly. That's where Microsoft's I would think so. Yeah. Yes. I would think so. And, I mean, and, I... I Genuinely have no idea, but yeah. Yeah, well, Christina, we should be very clear. It's not saying this is a spokesperson for no, Microsoft no, in any way, shape, or form. This is, uh, Christina's on a, uh, a busman's holiday. She's uh, talking about it on her own recognizance. Uh, one the reason why I think Wesley is right, though, yes. is that there has been a, a price shift in software as it comes to AI. AI software costs a lot of money. If you want the, the AI addition to Office 365, Microsoft 365, it's like 30 bucks a month. 30 a month, if you want to, yeah. Right. Open AI services, 20 bucks a month. We, right. People pay for this stuff. And There's by the way, that's price. still probably below cost, isn't it, Alex? I mean, this stuff is hideously expensive for these models to generate. Not to put Christina on the spot here, because I don't mean to make this about her company, but there was a, 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 a media report that came out that said that Copilot uh, at GitHub was a money-losing operation. Right. And then I believe- Even at 30 a month, CEO, yeah. And then I believe the CEO said, no, that's not true. And that's where we left it. Right. So it's it's not clear to me exactly what the margins here are, but there are costs. You're right. And I think it's also just like there's a price uh, threshold being set. And so consumers will expect to right. pay for AI. So to Wesley's point, if Windows 12 does have AI and upgrades and so forth, I can see that actually being reasonably well received by power users, the prosumers out there, and not mocked mercilessly like, I don't know, Windows 8. Right. right. Well, and when people use AI, it's, you know, it's funny. Uh, people are willing to pay for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, generally, people are not willing to pay for a subscription to news. But if you're making money on this subscription, if the journal helps you make money, you're willing to pay 175 bucks a year for it. Or and Bloomberg, I, right? Or like, Bloomberg. Like Bloomberg. Look is, how expensive you know, a terminal is. It's crazy. But 26, it 27,000 a year, right, Alex? Yeah, but it makes you money. I've never had one. Aw. I, the, the, the one thing I have not had in life is a Bloomberg terminal. It sounds like you I, want the one. Last thing. What would you do? Oh, I, Who doesn't want one? Really? I would do? go for one. Why? Be, oh, because it's got data. It, <laughs> I yes. went to Bloomberg in San Francisco and I sat down with the Bloomberg team and they gave me a tour. This was back when Bitcoin was brand new. So this must have been like, you know, 10, 10 years ago now. And they were just like, what do you want to know? I was just asking stuff and they were just pulling up the data, live ships around the world. It just, it, 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 if you It's are better than the internet? It's like the internet. Yeah. It's like, okay, if the internet is heroin, a Bloomberg terminal is fentanyl. It, it, here's the thing. It, it puts it, you it, to it, sleep forever? Internet? No, here's the thing. It's the internet. More, more. But it's like- it's like the it's it's like the internet for super rich people. It's like it's like the private club internet, right? It's it's yes. like the Delta Lounge. It's like the Centurion Lounge version of the internet. Like you get everything faster and better. But my point is, you're willing to pay a lot of money Correct. for it because it makes you money. And well, I think that's the whole thing. That that's why. Yes, it's going to yes. be the same thing for AI. Uh, 
you know, to talk to Scarlett Johansson, maybe not worth 20 bucks a month. Although I must say I'm paying 20 bucks a month for OpenAI, for uh, Gemini, from Google, and for Perplexity AI each. <laughs> I didn't get an R1. I should have done that. It would have saved me money. It would have been half price. <laughs> right. Hey, absolutely. Two hundred dollars. We're like, hey, you get this dumb, you know, gadget, but you also get the per thing. But you also Correct. get, uh, but, but you get the Perplexity Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Which is honestly, I'm, I'm happy about it only for the fact that it turned around a Perplexity Pro, and I was like, I really like Perplexity. Perplexity. Yeah, I have all is three it? because I want to try all three. I also run local models as well. I, although I have to say, maybe I need a surface because the local models do not run as quickly as ChatGPT does. ChatGPT is very oh, no. fast. It's kind of and four O is even faster. It's almost instant. Is perplexity better than Google's search generative experience? Oh God, can we hold off on that? Because I do want to talk okay. about that. But I, but I did say we would talk about recall. So let's let's do recall, and then we got to talk about. Putting Elmer's glue in your pizza toppings. <laughs> <laughs> so good. It's so good. Never but, change. But, uh, so uh, a couple of months ago, a company came out called Rewind, Rewind.ai, that promised on a Mac to record everything you do over a period of time and then allow you to query it, which seemed like a great idea. Then they came out with a limitless pin that proposed to record everything in your world with a little wearable device and let you query it. Uh, nobody got upset about this because I guess mainly because you had to, you know, subscribe and buy it. But Microsoft obviously paid attention because they have basically built this capability into the new Windows 11. Microsoft calls it recall. And it wasn't long before everybody in the privacy and security community started screaming screaming my hair's on fire here's one from lawrence abrams at bleeping computer microsoft new windows 11 recall is a privacy nightmare uh. except it's not really because it never leaves your device it's encrypted using bitlocker i mean the only reason recall would be a problem is if somebody got access to your pc then maybe there'd be a problem yeah, and in which case, if we're being completely candid, like you're screwed anyway, you're right? In, like, you're in trouble no matter what, yeah. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that Rewind.ai uh, is rebranded as Limitless.ai. Right. And the founder of the company did a little video clip on Twitter responding to people asking him like, oh my gosh, Microsoft you know, made recall. It's like, well, you guys were You've building- You've Sherlock. And he said, you Sherlock, yes. And he said, well, kind of. But what we're doing now is a personal private cloud. So that way we can do a recall style thing across multiple devices. Ah. And here's, I, I, I like the boldness of that. I like to try something bigger. Here's the thing. Uh, the cloud is not always as secure as I might personally wish it to be. Whereas my device right. is probably a little bit safer. And so to me, Microsoft is doing the smaller version of what now Limitless is doing, but it seems like something I could trust. But it's a, And it's also one device only though, right? It doesn't. It's 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 the particular device you're using it on. So if you have three PCs, each one is independent, right? That's my understanding. Yeah, but this is all I've got to play with it yet. You know, so testing to come. But actually, that sounds kind of lame though, Leo. Because then if I have three PCs and I'm you know I'm a dweeb, so I have several. I almost wish we could tie it to like my Microsoft account to my local host. Isn't network. this always the the problem? Is There's AI works better yes. if you have no privacy? <laughs> it always right. works so much better. Well, all these things do. Yeah. Well, all these things do. It's not even just AI, right? It's, it's like because if you think about it, like the AI component is is the natural language to service this this data. But like fundamentally, what these things are doing is they're, they're just you know capturing a bunch of information, right? And we're like, no, we love this, and we love that it's all on our local device because we don't want it in the cloud where it's unsafe. But at the same time, you know, I do kind of want it everywhere. <laughs> Because I want to be able to use it uh, because I'm also a dweeb, Alex, because I want to be able to access it on all the things that I'm on. Yeah, team dweeb. You know what, though, Christina, this actually underscores for me the importance of encryption. And yes, it underscores the importance of combating. I think currently the EU is trying to once again weaken yes. encryption. And it just goes to show that we cannot afford to lose that fight as always, but now even more so, because if we are going Agreed. to have more AI attached to our Boy, personal data, we need to ensure such a good point. Yes. that we're safe. Fantastic point. Yeah. Well, and that's why we've been really fighting over, over 
access to your smartphone because in effect that's what this is is a device that's collecting every bit of your information all your data smog is going into this device and if law enforcement can just easily access it uh you're an open book and it'll be 10 yeah. times worse with with the new ai technologies well no i mean and and, and that's what that's what i think um uh, microsoft needs to do a, a better job being very crisp on who has access? What you know, I think they've done access, a good job. I don't think that that's satisfied for some reason. That's satisfied privacy advocates. They just don't trust Microsoft. No, I mean, I, th I, I think, think. I mean, which is fair, but I think you need to just come out and say this is exactly how it works, right? Because the right. thing is, is that forensic software already exists. Meaning, um, you know, I don't know how well it works on the Mac, although I, it does actually work pretty well. But I know, like on Windows, like if you know, someone can get into your PC. That's the big thing. If they, if they can get through your, your password to log into your PC, they can put forensic software on there and they can see basically anything you've done. Right. Like yeah. they're, and, and it's really good. In many cases, your work is already doing that or your school is right. already doing that. And they don't have to tell you ahead of time. They don't have to tell you. Right. And so the difference here is there's no, actually you could surface some of that data yourself where it'd be useful. Be like, oh, what was that thing I looked up that, right. that, that had that thing with a thing? Yeah. And and you could find it. Like, okay, that's actually useful. But the the, the broader concerns, which I completely understand why they're there. Um, I mean, you know, it, it, I don't know how different, I guess my, my big misunderstanding with some of the uproar is, I don't know how this is that different than things that have already existed, it's right? It's like, it's okay, not. if it's all held locally, it's just being surfaced in a different manner, ah. but but they could already get access to this data anyway. You know? Christina, go back to the yes. top of the conversation. We're talking about Sam Altman, open AI and trust. And essentially the, the ability for people who are leaders and very visibly public leaders of AI to set the tone for trust between the public and technology. Here is yeah. where that rubber touches the road. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and this is a fancy list. UI. Yeah, this is a fancy UI of the history of your PC. So if they can get on it anyway, and it, it makes sense that it's not cloud connected because anything that touches the cloud can be subpoenaed. Right. Uh, encrypted or not. I mean, it's I don't know if the encryption is what do they call it, like post quantum encryption or not, which means it can be broken. So it, it's important that it's not cloud connected whatsoever. It needs to stay on device. Okay, but on the UI point though, Wesley. So what's really interesting is you just reminded me what it looks like. The the interface that shows the the scroll bar and then the, the moving um, rectangles of screen images, it's cover flow. The old like yes. iTunes yes. thing. Yes. yes. And oh I my know gosh, this, yes. this is evidence that I'm old. But I mean, we've seen this and it, it, it was great when it came out originally as cover flow. So and I think oh it looks my great God. now. You're as right. You're completely what is old correct. is new again. Oh my God. Well, You're technology I mean, is, a great thing. is a flat circle, <laughs> as we all know. You're just it's going true. around and around. It's true. I, I would use this though, I think, like recall. If once I, I get I would onto too. 11. No, same. I, I I think I would use this too. I think this is the sort of thing. I, I had a question in my mind. I was like, would you enable this or would you be weirded out? I'm like, no, I think I would use this because I, okay. And I'm one of these weirdos. I probably should admit this. I still have, even though I know it's a bad idea, I have like my Google search history turned on. And the reason is, is because I've on more than like a handle of occasions gone through and like found like search for certain queries and found things that I searched for like seven years ago. I was like, what was that thing with that thing that was the thing? You know, and and I do that all the time. Something in my search history. Yeah. I yeah. also have so, the location history turned on just because I like seeing right. oh, wow. the map going. Yeah. Ooh, 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 you've been here and here and here and here. I love that. So I think I would and use by this. the way, I bought the limitless pin. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I don't care. I want to know. I, I you know what? Part of it is because I'm getting old and I don't remember shit anymore. And so <laughs> so now I'm going to have a device that I can say, "What did I have for dinner?" And it'll know. <laughs> in a in a in a post Twitter world where like, did I see it on X? Did I see it yes, on that's Blue right. Sky? Right. Did I see it on was Mastodon? It was yes. it Slack? No, was, was it, it on cool, Threads? Right? Where was, was it? Was it on ICQ? No, ICQ doesn't exist anymore. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> no, I know it's dying in a month. We're so old. Aww. <laughs> Are we sad? What was? Your, do you remember your ICQ number? I do. What was it? One eight one one eight five six four five. Wow. I do not remember mine. You guys remember your ICQ numbers? I don't think if I've I ever had one. If I had that Microsoft thing, then maybe I would remember. But <laughs> you need, see, this is why. I need recall. You need recall. You could find out. <laughs> ICQ, which is now owned by, uh, what is it, VK Workspace? Uh, yeah, the Russians bought it like a million years ago. We, have, and we, like, have, we bought ICQ and now in June 26, we're killing it. 
So he's goodbye. But it's mostly goodbye, goodbye. to a piece of internet history, right? Yes. I mean, that's really what it was. I was going to be like, I haven't been able to log into that account and I don't know how long. Um, there used to be a way because AOL bought ICQ and you used to be able to log in um, via AIM with, with your ICQ right. number right. With, with Messenger, right? Um, but when AOL Instant Messenger died, and gosh, at this point, I think it's probably been six or seven years. And, yep. and I hadn't been able to log into that account even longer <laughs> before that. So it's been, I don't even know how long it's been, but it's, it's been at least 15 years since it's I've really been able to log into ICQ. The internet has now been around long enough that it, it, that it, it is littered, that its trail is littered with, you know, defunct tools. And this is uh, just one more of them. I was going to save that story to my obituary section because there's a few, but, <laughs> but we, we got a little, a little preview of the obituaries still to come. Let's take a little break. Uh, more to talk about in just a bit. Wesley Faulkner. Great to see you. Uh, any lizards, snakes, anything going on back there? <laughs> just this morning we had to bury our bunny. Oh, that, um, but so we do sorry. have four four baby chicks that we transitioned out of the incubator outside, oh. um, and so wait a minute, you uh, have a our, baby our chick incubator in your backyard? Well, no, it was inside, and now they're they've grown old enough that they've gotten most of their adult. You have feathers, so now they're an incubator in so, your house. Yes, and so we have um, <laughs> we have eight. Uh, nine other chickens, full grown. Oh, okay, and so now they're so they're you have a, a little chicken container. Coop. You have a whole yeah. We have chicken coop. operation. My sister in Sunnyvale does this. She has chickens now because she's becoming slowly a Neolithic <laughs> farmer, despite living in Silicon Valley. And it's, it's like the new cool thing, apparently, in at least amongst the California elites. here in Petaluma. So, I mean, it is ensconced into our city yeah. charter that you, everybody in Petaluma, is allowed to have chickens. It's a law. <laughs> <laughs> they eat scraps. It's they're like little and pigs eggs pop and so out. Like yeah, yeah, and then you get eggs every day. It's I mean, amazing. Great. Yeah, and then one day they may not make eggs, and then you make dinner. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> and then what you do is once they've outlived their usefulness, is you murder them and then cook them. I mean, I eat chicken, but it does feel a little barbaric. <laughs> I had vegans over for dinner last night. So eggs I'm, I'm, are their like their next generation of. Chicken, so that's like, a good point. You're you, eating their you, embryos. You get them at the beginning, yeah. or you get them at the end. I Either mean, way, it's a circle of yeah. dinner. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know we were going there today. Yeah, on the no show. idea. No idea. Uh, also, Alex Wilhelm in his backyard, he's got him. It's called an Alex Coop, and uh, that's yes. where he is right now in the Alex Coop. I am in the Alex uh, Cube. You might say it's the. Yeah. Uh, it's where my wife lets me put all my things. It's really um, so that way they're, they're I'm so the jealous. It's so cute. I wish we'd thought of it when I lived there in 1967. Yes, um, you all know that, right? That Alex lives in the house that I grew up in in Providence, Rhode Island. It's, it is one of the strangest coincidences <laughs> of my life. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so yeah. weird. Uh, in fact, I was just, uh, you know, on the uh, Amazon Echo, I get, I have a slideshow and I just yesterday saw my dad sitting where you are right now Aww. on a lounge chair with his hat, uh, contemplating. He was about 32 and I'm thinking, oh my God. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Now, now this house is, is strictly owned by one 17 month old child who has Aww. more toys and goods and things Aww. and books and blocks than like, like she has a. Um, a sandbox, right? That's on wheels, so we can roll it around. You're actually supposed to do that with a chicken coop, so that it doesn't ruin your yard. <laughs> we are not getting chicken. We have too That's many how you scramble the eggs. <laughs> Dude, I want fewer animals in my house. <laughs> not when more. I was looking into having chickens, because as you know, that is my right as a Petaluma native. Uh, I did look into. They have chicken coops that roll. Because you probably know this, uh, Wesley, wherever the chickens roost really becomes unpleasant. <laughs> a slime yeah, pit. They'll decimate grass yeah, as well. Yeah, so it's like right. you can rotate them. for. But the, if, you, they, if you roll it around, then they back. can decimate your yeah. whole yard bit by bit. It's, uh, <laughs> it's an innovative approach. Um, anyway, I'm glad. It's nice that Alex and his... Uh, you have a... Is his public? Did we say it? You have a young... A new, another young one on the way. 
Yes, number two of two. The the last one, if you will, <laughs> the I'm not doing three, arrives in early September, and we're very excited for having Aww. another girl. Yay! Two and, girls. Uh, That's awesome. Oh yeah, it's gonna be fantastic. And I we already have a name kind of picked out. We're getting closer to that, and we have a we have a C section on the books, man. So we are gearing up, and I am yeah terrified, absolutely <laughs> terrified. I do not blame you. Here is the picture that I promised you of my father sitting. This would be 1966, 67, something like that. Uh, come on, come on. It's not that big a shot. Oh, it's not coming up. Right where you're working, which is so Leo weird. Leo has come over since Liza and I, I have. have owned this house. See if, you seen... recognize, see if you recognize this plot of land. This is where, that's my dad. Where you're oh, sitting man. right now. It looks so... We've built like a whole back deck. <laughs> I know. It's very different. Like that, that really doesn't look that much like it, the house. Yeah. That's crazy. There is... Uh, I will show you also. There is, as you know... Well, this is... So when we moved in, the backyard was filled with junk. So mm -hmm. we had a rototill it. That's me with my dad behind me rototilling exactly... Where that oak tree just outside your door is. Yeah, right, right over there. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we wow. found bottle, hundred-year-old list liquor bottles. We found handguns. We found all sorts of stuff. We had to rototill it up to make it the nice the verdant plot that it is right now. Yes, and yes. The, the background here is the reason why there were bits of ancient detritus is because the house was originally built in 1806. Yes. Which is very close to the founding of this nation, you will yes. recall, 30 years after. And here, so is, it's, it's, here is dad planting the tree. They called it a pin oak when he planted it. It's tiny. How big is that now? Um, it's so big now that whenever we have a rainstorm like we did two days ago, I'm always worried it's going to fall onto my work shed and kill me. I it's got to it. be like 100 I I'll brought you a picture. Lee. It's I, huge. I, no, I took a picture of it when I was visiting, and I gave it to my dad. And uh, that's kind of a neat thing that you know. What is it? Sixty years later, yeah. Uh, the tree that he planted is now giant. It's awesome, and it's it's very expensive because the jerks behind <laughs> us cut a bunch of the roots. So oh now, no! Several, several times a year, the tree people have to come out. And oh. do special fertilizer, special watering, oh. and then verify that it's healthy. So well, tell your dad you. we are. Yeah, his tree's well cared for. Thank you for keeping it alive, uh, which is we love it. Yeah, that's really awesome. It's such a nice story. And Christina Warren, who is uh, in Seattle, Washington, we can't tell because uh, it's very blurry there. It must be the fog. It's the fog. No, and it honestly, the fog is 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 real. Like it is. It is the end of May and it is still a high of 60 <laughs> degrees. Oh, <laughs> We've never had like a cold, at least as long as I've lived here, there's never been a cold snap like this. It's, it's, Ugh. um, apparently it was lovely. Like the one week I was gone, I was of in Atlanta course. and Atlanta was, it was a disaster. And then I was Portland and Portland was lovely. And uh, apparently it was very nice here. And I came back and I'm like, is it actually like, it's like the last week of May and it's still. This is good for me to hear because we have thought yeah. for a long time about moving to Seattle. I thought it'd be kind of fun to retire up there. And every time we go, it's beautiful, it's sunny, it's warm. I ask, this right. is gorgeous. And they lie to you. They lie. They lie to you. It's a lie. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, it's like this all the time. No, mm -mm. it's not. Mm -mm. Um, uh, for, for a few months out of the year, and usually it starts already at this time, it is really lovely. And so that's how they trick you. Yes. And then October rolls around and you go, oh, <laughs> I right. got it. I grew up in the PAC Northwest. I consider myself to be a PAC Northwest expert. And let me tell you, Leo, the weather is better in Petaluma. Yeah. You shouldn't move. It's really you nice. Stay where you I, are. Our, our and you can have chickens. Very nice. And I can have chickens. Right. So there. Our show, to, <laughs> it's great to have all of you here. You make it, you make, I tell you, I look forward to hanging out with the, uh, each and every one of you. You're really uh, fantastic. And of course, our wonderful audience. We have a great community. That's one of the things I realized after 20 years, we are in our 20th year now of doing Twit. And uh, uh, you learn a thing or two in a couple of decades, one of which is it's all about the community. That's what podcasting is all about. The community of people who, are more than listeners. They're participants in it. We have a new way that you can do it. 
which is to join our club. If you want to join a community of smart, interesting people who hang out in our Discord, who listen to our shows, who call into some of our shows, I invite you to join Club Twit. It's seven bucks a month. It makes a big difference to us. A lot less than the Wall Street Journal. And maybe it doesn't make you as much money as a Bloomberg terminal. But it is a lot of fun. You'll get all of our shows ad-free. You'll get video of shows that we only do in audio in public. Plus Twit Plus bonus content like that crazy watch party we did with Fritz Lang's Metropolis a couple of weeks ago. We've got a Stacy's book club. Your friend Stacy Higginbotham Wesley coming up. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, on June 20th. We also uh, have a lot of other benefits, but really the real benefit is knowing that you're helping us stay on the air. We unfortunately do need your support to continue doing what we do. We'd like to do it. So please go to twit.tv slash club twit. If you're not already a member, and sign up today. We thank you in advance. We'll have more in just a bit with this fabulous panel, but first a word from our sponsor for this segment of This Week in Tech, NetSuite. The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your product or service, the more margin you have, the more money you get to keep. In order to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, all into one platform, which means one source of truth. With NetSuite, you reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware required, can be accessed from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite. You improve efficiency by bringing all your major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move to NetSuite. So do the math. See how you'll profit. With NetSuite. By popular demand, NetSuite has extended its one of a kind flexible financing program for just a few more weeks. So don't delay. Head to netsuite.com slash twit. That's netsuite.com slash twit. N E T S U I T E. Netsuite.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of this week in tech. Actually, in a couple of weeks, we're going to uh, stream the. Uh, Apple keynote. We talked about build on Wednesday. We we talked about uh, uh, OpenAI's Chat 4.0 on uh, last Monday. Uh, Google had its I/O in which they said the words AI 120 times in two hours, and we only know that that's once a minute. Come to think of it, we only know that because uh, Nadella admitted to it. He said we've had AI counting all this time. I don't think the Google I/O Kino was much to write home about, to be honest. Um, I can't recall much of what they announced. Yeah, me neither. That yeah. They really want developers to know that they're doing AI. Now, please think about us for your cloud needs. Ironically, with what, I mean, two hour keynote and all that, the mm -hmm. real takeaway from Google I.O. is what's happened to their AI answers in search. Google uh, had a... Uh, well, it's from the Google Labs SGI, uh, that or SGE, I guess they call it, search generated experience or something like that. That they finally they turned on for everybody. Almost immediately, people start saying, "Oh, I am getting weird results." They call it the AI overview, which is a summary paragraph ahead of your search results. But some of the things it's telling people to do are a little outré. For instance. Put glue on your pizza to keep the cheese from falling off. <laughs> can you can you pull up the headline from four hundred four? Yes, because uh, yes. it, it's it's. I don't know if we can say. I it can't on the show, say it out like, loud, but right. So they figured out that the actual um, information that Google was was uh, was serving up came from Reddit. Google, we know, yeah. gave Reddit sixty million dollars. <laughs> uh, they found. They found the, uh, this is the AI overview. Cheese can slide off pizza for a number of reasons, including too much sauce, too much cheese, or thickened sauce. Here are some things you can try. You can also add about an eighth cup of non-toxic glue to the sauce to give it more tackiness. Now, it probably won't kill you, but it's probably not a good idea. 404 pointed out, that, and I guess they got this from a, uh, from a tweet, 
404 pointed out that this actually was Google AI regurgitating something it had learned from Reddit. Wait a minute, let me see if yes. I can find the. And and by the way, the redditor <laughs> who uh, posted that, I don't know if I can say it uh, out loud. F Smith was his yes. uh, handle. F Smith. So yes, maybe this isn't worth sixty million dollars after all maybe not maybe not i don't know it, it, it seems one of those things i'm like hmm um i i am a person who very frequently uh, appends reddit to my various yes. searches right. because that's that that we've, we've been trained in the last few years and that's one of the only ways you can get a good result unless you do what i now do which is to pay for a search engine i've become one of those people um but if you're not doing that i'm like i'll, I'll append that having said that I don't know if I would if I would put in you know like even and I bet even if I did append Reddit uh, to like how to make cheese not fall off a pizza I don't think that that's the first result that I would get. Yeah, in fact, it's really weaponized the ability to pull crap out of, out of Reddit. Uh, right. There are a few more. Uh, Patrick Cosmo, these are all from uh, X.com. Patrick Cosmo, and by the way, Google's response is, "Well, no, I mean, these are unusual circumstances, or you were you were messing with us." Has a dog you were ever doing it wrong? You were doing it wrong. It's your fault. Has a dog ever played in the NBA? Yes, a dog has played in the NBA, according to AI overview. Is Batman a cop? Yes, Batman is a cop yes. because he works with the law as an agent of Detective Jim Gordon, who deputizes him. Batman is called by the bat signal to solve, stop, or catch a crime, which is something the government does. <laughs> really? Sometimes. The bat signal? Does government I mean, do that? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Batman is kind of a cop. If you Okay, that's the only one I kind of agree with. I think Batman is kind of a cop. Okay. Batman's not not a cop, right? Correct. I don't think he's actually a cop, but he's he's... Cop adjacent, if you're correct. Here's he's one of my favorites. He, he could never, he could never be arrested for doing something illegal. So thus, he's a cop. Oh, he's got uh, what do they Qual call that? Qualified uh, immunity. Yeah, 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 qualified immunity. How many presidents graduated from the University of Wisconsin? According, this is the AI overview. According to the Wisconsin Alumni Association, thirteen presidents. By the way, John Adams. <laughs> graduated in 1934, 35, 47, 51, 54, 57, 60, 61, 68, 69, 71. John Adams, really? 73, John 74, Adams. 76, 77, 79, 81, 87, 1990, 2002, and 2003. I have to say, when AI fails, it fails spectacularly. It does. But but also, how could this, this open AI feel about this? <laughs> Oh, my because, God. Andrew Jackson graduated, genuinely... according to Google, in 2005. James Madison graduated in 1956. <laughs> William Harrison graduated in 53 and 74. Do you know what pisses me off about this? What makes me so infuriatingly mad is that Google search was good and simple. They have screwed and then it they up. They have consistently it. crapified it. They have and so screwed unnecessarily. it up. Unnecessarily. For, for yes. example, on, on YouTube, which we all use, when you search for something, it now gives you like what, five links that are like what you search for. And then it says, people also watched, go away. <laughs> Please stop trying to help me. Google you know has, I am able to think. <laughs> Google has paused this uh, feature, but not before we found many hilarities like this. How many rocks shall I eat? According to geologists at UC Berkeley, you should eat at least one small rock a day. <laughs> they say the rocks are a vital source of minerals and vitamins that are important for digestive health. This has to be a joke. Dr. Joseph Granger suggests eating a server of gravel, geodes, or pebbles with each meal, or hiding rocks in foods like ice cream or peanut butter. <laughs> no, don't do that. Rocky Road? Rocky Road. Hey. You know, I think this is actually chicken advice, right? Don't chickens have to eat rocks? <laughs> yes, they have to eat some yeah. gravel. But there was another one that I saw. It was like, how many sisters do I have? And someone says, well, you ask someone else how many brothers they have, then multiply times two. And it was just... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I don't know who came up with uh, this one. Here is uh, from, uh, from our own Burke McQuinn, The Rock Eating Rocks. <laughs> How do you think the rock got so big, right? Not gravel, but giant no, boulders, it, ladies and gentlemen. Proper nutrition and push-ups, of course. <laughs> There's nothing artificial whatsoever in his physique. Oh, good Lord. Um, what were they thinking? 
Did they use this before they shipped it out to everybody in the world? This is um, Google search. Google spokesperson Megan Farnsworth, according to The Verge, said the mistakes came from, quote, generally very uncommon queries. You're right. I think asking how many rocks you should eat is a little weird. And aren't representative Ooh, of most Who would have a sample of queries? Hmm. <laughs> who would have that information? Right. How could they right. get that? How, how could you No know one could have complete. Yes. And also, how many presidents have graduated from, like, a university? That's not... <laughs> Uh, I that's mean, not that's that not that a weird. super common query, yeah. but, but that's that's like a query that you're non pre, you know, doing the generative AI push is, is like a knowledge based thing that Google used to get wrong. But at least, you know, they had some sort of overview of being able to report that it was wrong. Now, can you even report that these things are incorrect when they even come right. in? Like, do Here's you think that ability? I think the mistake is not that Google's Gemini AI is somehow more prone to hallucination. I don't think it is. The mistake is simply right. doing that AI overview in search results. Yes. And uh, I'm sure in that position, Perplexity and Claude and everybody else at OpenAI would make similar mistakes or something. Maybe not so bad. Those are pretty awful. <laughs> but, but this is what happens with AI. AI has to be used responsibly. And Google is so desperate to, you know, cash in on AI or not to be left behind, maybe even more importantly. Maybe they shouldn't have laid off all those people. Hmm. Um, I don't know. What what went wrong? At Google? Yeah. Ed Zittrain oh, says Pragavan, uh, Pragavan, uh, Pra Prabhakar Raghavan was what went wrong, the new guy in charge. Yeah. Here's the McKinsey guy in charge. Yeah, McKinsey. It's not one person. The Here's problem is they had one business line, guys, and they had to juice it for more and more revenue, so they found people who could do that. Right? Here because from uh, LinkedIn is a, uh, a message from Scott Jensen who left. He says, I just left Google last month. The AI projects I, were, I was working on were poorly motivated and driven by this mindless panic that as long as it had AI in it, it would be great. This myopia is not something driven by a user need. It's a stone-cold panic that they're getting left behind. The vision is that there will be a Tony Stark-like Jarvis assistant in your phone that locks you into their ecosystem so hard you'll never leave. That vision, pure catnip. The fear is they can't afford to let someone else get there first. Now, this is the telling point. Scott says the exact thing happened 13 years ago with Google Plus, I was there for that fiasco at well as well. That was a similar reaction, but to Facebook. That's a, that rings true. Whether it is, I don't know. It does. It rings true. It's panic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that that definitely rings true. I think that's how you see like how much was this stuff tested. It definitely comes across as people who are like, I, we're getting all kinds of pressure from all of our bosses and our bosses' bosses and their bosses' bosses that we need to push this out as quickly as possible. And hey, the testing seems fine to us. Um, we don't have time to do maybe as in-depth as we would like to because we we are responding to everything. And instead, yeah, you take this thing, which had been the best, the best in class for a long time to the point that it literally obviated many, 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 every other attempt at a search engine. Like the fact that, um, like I pay for a search engine now, the, if you would ask me that even five years ago, I've been like, what are you talking about? Why do I ever pay for a search engine ever? Right. The fact that it's even a business. Which right one now, do you uh, fact pay that you for? Can even, uh, Kagi. Me too. Or, or Love it. Yeah. Uh -huh. I used to and, use Neva, and, and, which by the way, did AI overviews, although I never saw anything so <laughs> egregious from Neva. They right. went out of business. They said, we can't compete against Google. Uh, how much do you pay? I, pay, I think I pay 25 bucks a month for Kagi. Um, I am part of a family plan or do a plan. So my friend Justin got it first. And then I think it was, I think it's $75 a year. That's what I've been with Justin because I'm part of his duo plan. I yeah. think it's like $150. It's worth for, it, isn't for it? two people. It's pretty good. For me, it has been. Yeah. It's gotten really good. I got to the point that I had become so frustrated with Google that I was like, I, I'm actually going to be one of those people who pays for a search engine. We'll see how it goes. And it's been really good so far. I have to say, I, I've been getting much better results. I've gone through the process of making it my default on all my devices. Um, apparently, Google uh, released this thing, um, uh, um, like a way where you can access like the unadulterated search yes. from Google. And and so um, I, I put a link to that in, in the various chats, but um, but but um, Ernie from Tedium has also created a great website, udm14.com, which oh. basically just gives you like the AI free search directly 
So that comes from um, the fact that somebody discovered if you add ampersand UDM equals 14 to any Google search, and this is a Google search, it will not give you any of the AI stuff. Right. And, and, and this didn't even come from like the, the way that was discovered was that this was bizarrely on May 14th. This was tweeted out by the, the Google search page on who I think is uh, Danny Sullivan says we've launched a new web filter that shows only text based links, just like how you might filter other types of results. And so this is a thing they actually introduced officially, which is great. Really fantastic. They did that. But of course, the way to natively kind of do that. Um, is is a pain, and so a number of different websites have popped up so that people can configure they just it append to be it. their default. They just append it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, if you search Google now for should I eat rocks, what you'll get is all the news stories of Google <laughs> saying you should eat right. rocks. This is hysterical. Because Google's like, no, because they've had to go in manually. This is this is the, 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 the awful thing with stuff like this. And look, it, it could happen to anyone. Any company who would do this would run into these sorts of problems and and we do and it would be a joke and we'd laugh at it. I think it is worse when it's Google and you were so good for so long that no one could even begin to compete with you. I mean, Microsoft, I mean, God, how much time have, has Microsoft Microsoft spent trying to make being a thing, right? Like it, it you know, and and now just the the own goaling here is of, of, of Google search is, is really spectacular. The main reason we pay for Kagi is because there's no ads. And even Larry Page in the beginning, in the earliest days in his first paper about PageRank said, a search engine can't sell ads because that compromises the results. For a long time, there was a, a wall between revenue, ad sales, and search. And that's what Ed Zittrin was writing about when he said, uh, you know, as soon as uh, Gomes left or was replaced by Prabhakar Raghavan, that wall disappeared and Google started tweaking its search results for more revenue. But I don't think that explains it all. It's clearly something's going on. And this crown jewel has been destroyed. It's worth, it's worth it for you and me to pay to, to use a different search engine. That's yep. amazing. Wow. You're you know, right. No one would have said that five years ago. It would have sound nuts. Yeah. So, so Kagi, K-A-G-I, if you want to look up what they're talking about, um, I was just poking around while you guys were talking about it, and I saw that it had raised one funding round, and I was like, okay, that's kind of strange. It only has one round of $670,000. This was a bootstrapped company until yeah. last year when mm -hmm. it raised less than a million, which is an insane thing because in the technology world today, anyone who's going to go out there and build something that's competitive t tries to raise lots of money very quickly to go fast. Yeah. But in this case, you guys are paying two and three figures per year for a product that was effectively bootstrapped by some dweebs. That yes. is a cool story. Stephen Wolfram's, on, Stephen Wolfram's on their board too, which adds to some of the cachet, right? Founded in 2018 by a guy named Vladimir Prelovac in Palo Alto. Uh, bootstrapped by the founder. Um, he must have had a, some other. He sold, he sold something and made some money off of it. So yeah. he's been bootstrapping it. Um, the, how I first became aware of it was that um, he also makes this thing, the Orion web browser, which is right. a WebKit based browser for Mac, but it uses Chrome extensions, which right. is pretty, oh. which is pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Zero telemetry. So that's how I first came across it. You know, our friend Corey Doctorow has said that uh, the widespread use, I think it's now, according to Pew, 52% of all Americans use ad blockers. He says the widespread use of ad blockers is the largest consumer boycott in history. And I think that's mm -hmm. what we're seeing. I think we're seeing yeah. consumers finally say, hey, enough. Uh, even people who are not tech savvy or not really even paying attention are noticing right. it's not working. Right. Well, and the thing is, is that, you know, I, I, I always, I'm always frustrated by the ad um, tech situation because I think that a lot of people, there, there's always going to be a portion of people and, and the audience for this show is certainly going to be largely, have more people in, in, in this segment than um, maybe others, but there's always going to be a portion of people who will just reject any advertisement at all. But I think there are plenty of people who are like, no, if the ad is tasteful and if it's not in my face and if you don't aren't giving pop-ups and if you're not slowing things down, if you're not making my overall experience worse, fine, I don't care. Um, but when you know, the ad tech has gone out of its way to be just such a completely terrible experience. You can't blame individuals from doing everything they can to know that the first thing you do when you 
get a new web browser is install uBlock Origin, right? Like that's yeah. that's one of the first things you do. Yes, we've been the, the, preaching that for years now, right? Well, I just got a new computer for for work, so I'm now helping out with this speaking startup. So they bought me a computer, Aww. and I forgot to install uBlock, whatever the hell it is that we all use. Yep. And I was pulling up a YouTube, and oh my god, it's amazing. The it's, ad it's load was absolutely yeah. bonkers. I ref I absolutely will never use that product because no. Right. Just just hard pass. That's how they get me to pay a lot of money for YouTube premium. I was going to say I have I have a, a grandfather Dan YouTube premium account that I don't I don't even want to talk about it because I'm afraid that the, the grandfather pricing will somehow go away. So we won't talk about it. But yeah, I will never not pay for YouTube premium, even if they make me pay the actual amount. Oh, I do. I do. I just, it's worth it. I will it. pay. No, no, I, no. I, oh, I, that's what I'm saying. There's never a situation where I will not pay for it. Right. I will always oh, yeah, pay yeah, for yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's why Club Twit is such a good deal. It's only $7 And a only month $7 to get results. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Leo's giving you a steal. <laughs> Tap it's in. It's a deal. <laughs> also, can I, can not, I, yes. can I say it's an old person thing? Yes. Um, you're not, you're not Christina, nearly old enough to say it, but go ahead. I remember the days of shareware where you would get software and it oh, itself yeah. would just have other Stop software working. that would I would advertise and stuff like that. That's yeah. what I feel like in terms of ads yeah. on the internet these days is just that it's 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 something that was pervasive everywhere, but eventually we'll be transitioning to something else. I know we're all getting subscription out of our ears now, but um Moving into a model where there might be subscription umbrellas, where you get groups of subscriptions or something oh, a humble comes bundle with your ISP or something. Yeah, or something that's like a that. good mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, because but it really is true that we were sold a lie that the internet was based on a lie that this stuff was all free. It was never free. Right. Yeah. It was always expensive, and somebody had to pay somewhere. Uh, and so I think making it explicit and saying. You know these podcasts aren't really free. We were we were subsidizing them by selling your eyeballs right. to an advertiser, but now that that economy is faltering, and that's what's going on with Twit is that it's not just Twit; it's every podcast network. It's every yeah. it's everywhere. It's it's also public broadcasting. Uh, yeah. Advertisers have stopped buying ads, or if they are buying ads, they're buying them where they know everything about you, like Spotify, and so we just don't have the revenue anymore. And we have to go to the audience and say, you know, this thing that was formerly free was never free. We were selling your eyeballs, but now we have to charge you if you want us to keep doing it. It's it's kind of the way of the world. I'm sorry to say we, we were lied to. If you know the marketing funnel, um, the top of the funnel is exposure and awareness. And so there, the, the lie is also to advertisers saying, like, get exposure by putting your brand here. Right. And then... The, the, the issue, that I would say the premium about being an advertiser on Twit is that it's not at that level. It's lower, which means it's closer to the conversion at the end of the funnel, which means it's more valuable. Would you so, please go to work on our sales team? Because <laughs> we need, we need to advertise. Here's the real problem. Agencies especially, but advertisers to some degree also, are impatient and, and, and not very subtle. And so you can explain they, that to they're them. They're less... They're less impatient and more motivated by clicks because yeah. that's the metric that they're tracking. That's right. And so if if you abstract like their own specific KPIs or whatever of what they're getting paid for and move closer to what actually works, then it makes more sense to kind of move people down the Absolutely. funnel. Absolutely. I wish the they'd pay attention to the ROI yeah. of, of our advertising, but they, they're not, I don't know, they're not sophisticated enough. It's too much work. I don't know. Uh, and yeah. also the agency and model no, no. doesn't incent them to do that. The agency model incents them to, to spend as much of your ad dollar as possible so they get the largest <laughs> commission possible. Yes. And the reason why Christiane and I both are in developer relations is because that's why... Um, that's that's why we do what we do because we're embedded with the community. Right. We 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 talk to people. Right. They, we gain their trust um, by being genuine, being authentic, being transparent. People know when they talk to us that we are not going to be just making stuff up. It's or the only way you can. Sell. Yeah. It's the only way yeah. you can do it. Correct. It's the only way we sell. The way we at this point we don't have a sales team anymore. It's all Lisa, our CEO, but she will tell people no. She will say, look, I'm not. We're not going to work for you. Let's. 
discuss your marketing strategy. Let's talk about how this works. She is very big on that, but unfortunately, very few agencies have the time or in inclination to sit and listen. They just go, you know, what's your CPM and when can you start? Yeah. Yeah. People are not going to be easy to get to. No. We're getting harder to find. We're getting harder to figure out good. who is the, the good alignment. And right. so specialized industries like what Christina does and what I do. Um, and then Alex, he's making his own brand. And so yep. he's Huge. building an audience. Yes. This this is where we're moving to. This is going to be so. where I think you were you're ahead of the game. But I think the, the whole world is going to be catching up to that. And I think it's going to be better. Because yeah. I, I think that the incentives around advertising-based businesses always end up eating themselves. And we were talking about the the crapification of Google search. And a big component of that is the movement of ads from the right rail to the top. And then yeah. to look more and more like search results and then more and more of them. And so now when you go to Google, you get like, did you mean to ask this a question you didn't want to ask? And then also here's 17 ads. Congratulations. There's your search result. If you pay for something it can be better. And so I think probably if enough people um, are willing to step up for Twit and they have a subscription base, that'll make for a more stable in time and therefore better service. And I think that, you know, the thing I was working out at TechCrunch for a long time, TechCrunch Plus, that is no longer with us, RIP, um, RIP. was the same, the same goal. Like get away from the incentives of uh, like farming attention and trying to drive the max audience possible. I mean, there's a reason why the New York Times is what it is today and Mashable is not. The and trick if is you to pay for things to, means you have money. The, the trick is to also, survive that through that transition, right? Which uh, is not easy. Not easy. So right. many are not, and uh, including Rocket, right? Uh, which it, is it, no, but you're greatly exactly missed, right. Greatly missed. No, I mean totally, and 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 you know we we ended up for a number of reasons, but definitely the the ad market slowdown was was a real part of it, right? It made us have to do more and more to, to make sure that we were going to be giving our listeners who did you know, pay for a subscription, what they were wanting, but yeah, you just, sometimes you just have to call it. And, and, and we did, um, no, but you're exactly right. Find, making it through that transition period is difficult. I mean, one of the, in retrospect, very smart things the Wall Street Journal did, uh, now they, they've made their, their paywall more and less porous over the years. They never went free for all. It was always a paid product and they were online early. Like they were online early, early, early. Like I had an online subscription when I was in middle school. Um, and so the, my, my aunt and uncle got me for my birthday or Aww. Christmas or something because, Aww. yeah, cause I was that kind of child. They wanted to be like, a oh, stockbroker. Yes. No, I asked for it. Wow. So yeah, I mean, I don't wow. know what that, I know exactly what that says about me, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was I was reading, I was, exactly I was having, me. uh, uh, Issues of Punch magazine sh shipped to me overseas. It would take like three months to get to me when I was a kid. Uh, I don't know what that says about me either. That was the British satire right. magazine. While we're doing this story, I had a bunch of annual reports delivered to my parents' house because what? in the Wall Street Journal, there was a little thing, like a little um, pamphlet, and you could check the boxes for the yeah. companies where the report's from. I just checked all the industry boxes, <laughs> and like several hundred pounds them. of annual reports came oh, to my house. Oh, mom and dad must like, have been so proud. What did you buy? <laughs> and I was like, you I don't love understand. That so much. I'm going to yeah. read bank earnings. And they were like, our son sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Wesley, what did you do as a kid? Played Nintendo and uh, yeah, there you go. Outside, you were smart. I guess. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah you, 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 yeah, you, you, you're the smart one out of all of us. Um, you had friends. You, I was exactly. I was gonna say you had friends. Me, it was like I had a, a subscription to Variety and we were poor. Um, and, and, Variety. and part of Wall Street it. Journal. Wow, Variety and the Wall Street yeah. Journal. Wow. I yep. watch a lot of PBS. Oh, yes, well, there you go. All right, that's good. We only PBS got four channels, good. man. I watched Gilligan's Island, so that tells you something. Uh, let's take a little break. More to come. And we have to talk about the rabbit because you actually own yeah. one, Christina. The yeah, R1. I do. Um, I will go grab it. Go grab your rabbit. You do well, a break. That yes. sounds filthy. While I talk it about does. <laughs> so Christina's going to grab her rabbit while we talk about our sponsor. Uh, this episode of This Week in Tech brought to you by Bitwarden. Now, this is a sponsor I love and I can get behind. I love Bitwarden, the open source password manager that offers a cost-effective solution that can dramatically increase your chances of staying safe online. And Bitwarden is fantastic. I've used it, oh gosh, now a couple of years. Uh, it was easy to move to, and it gets better all the time. It's one of the advantages of being uh, open source. 
For instance, uh, one of our uh, listeners on Security Now, Quexon, wrote a couple of uh, plugins for Bitwarden to replace PBKDF2, which is kind of unreliable, Argon2, uh, and uh, Scrypt. Uh, after analysis, because remember, they're open source. They, they accept pull requests. After some analysis, he and uh, Bitwarden decided to implement Argon2. And now that's an available choice for Bitwarden users, meaning you can have memory hard password hashing much better than any other tool, thanks to being open source. They also just announced that they are now officially supporting pass keys. They've supported pass keys for a while, but this is on browser extensions and mobile devices which I really like. You know, GitHub's a perfect example of the best possible implementation of pass keys. Well, now when I go to GitHub, I can click the button, and instead of entering a password, my pass key pops up from Bitwarden. I log in securely, effectively, and it's there. It's on every device, iOS, on Android. It's in uh, open beta on Android, Mac, and Windows, too. I think this is fantastic. World Password Day was earlier this month. Bitwarden surveyed 2,400 individuals from the U.S., U.K., Australia, France, Germany, and Japan and found out some interesting things. For instance, 31% <laughs> of U.S. respondents reuse passwords across sites. We know how dangerous that is. 42% incorporate personal information like your birthday, your dog's name, your middle name, your mother's maiden name both of which raise real concerns about password security and strength. 58% of respondents continue to use their memory. 58%. You know what that tells me? If, you, if you're trying to remember passwords, you're not reusing passwords. 34% continue to use pen and paper for password management at work. You know what that means? Post-it notes on the on the monitor. Nearly a quarter of respondents view their workplace security habits as risky. They know. 45% store passwords insecurely. 44% use weak credentials. There really is a lot of risk if you've got a business in letting your users do their own thing. You need Bitwarden. Bitwarden empowers enterprises, developers, and individuals to store and share sensitive data safely. By the way, for developers, Bitwarden's secret tool is so great because instead of storing your 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 secrets, your AWS credentials, and then accidentally pushing it up to GitHub, you can store it in Bitwarden so it's not available to anybody, but it still works. You still have access to it. Things like that. Transparent, open source approach to password management what is what really makes Bitwarden Fantastic. Easy to use, easy to extend, easy to use robust security practices. This is what you need for your business. And as an individual, it's what you need too. Now, I know everybody who listens to this show is already using a password manager because, of course, you're smart. You know it. If you're not, Bitwarden. And, and, and tell your friends and family, Bitwarden, because it's open source, it's free forever uh, for individuals. So that means that's a huge. That means you can have unlimited passwords, pass keys. You can use hardware, security devices if you want, free forever. They also have a great free trial for teams or enterprises. Or, of course, as an individual, get started for free across all devices. I think Bitwarden is the only way to go. Bitwarden.com slash twit. It's the one I use, the one I recommend. Bitwarden.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support and for making a great product. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Bitwarden. All right, let me see your R1. Show us your rabbit, Christina. All right, this is the rabbit R1. Um, it is currently, I don't know if it's either charging or it's doing something. So, uh, it, because the the battery on it was was dead because shocker, I haven't used it in a long time. But yeah, but this, this, is, this is the device. Also, there's no really way. There's no real way to turn it off. So it's kind of like AirPods Max where they just, it's like, oh, it'll go into low power mode. I'm like, you liar. So now it's at like a 7%. And I don't know if it's doing an update or if it's doing a charge. I'm not sure what. What is it but doing? No, but this is the device. So I don't it's know. cute. It looks like a it, rabbit on a wheel. It's cute. It is cute. Teenage engineering designed. Emily Shepard decided to do a little search on the folks behind Rabbit. Uh, Ed Zittrain wrote it up in his uh, on his uh, blog, Where's Your Ed At? Rabbit Hold is the name of his, <laughs> H-O-L-E-D is, is the name of his piece. And then CoffeeZilla also made a YouTube video. It, his, the YouTube video has the most, um, of course, sensationalistic headline. $30 million AI is hiding a scam. 
I don't know if it's a scam, but the company that makes it in November 2021 raised $6 million for a next generation NFT project called Gamma. Um, a decentralized organization that is sending 10K crew members into space to complete energy harnessing missions across the universe. It's not sci-fi. They actually... They actually were trying to raise money by selling an NFT. Holding a Gamma NFT would grant you exclusive membership to the Gamma Space Station. Wow. Including other perks like staking opportunities, tickets to Gamma Studios, limited edition merch, and live events. Well, obviously, uh, this was a scam. Is, is scam too harsh? It was no. Um, no, 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 no. I, look, I'm look. I'm not going to call the rabbit a scam because I have one. I will call the NFT thing a scam. Yeah, that I think feels but fair. The same person who did this, the CEO of Gamma, was and is a guy named Jesse Liu. He's the co-founder of Rabbit. He's also yep. on the board, by the way, at Teenage Engineering. I don't. Does this tarnish the rabbit? We've we'll also learned that the rabbit really is just an Android device running an Android app, that the AI involved is ChatGPT 3.5, and yeah. that every time you try to use it to do anything, it seems to fail. Have you ever been able to get an Uber with your rabbit? Oh, I would never, I would never input my Uber credentials into the rabbit. Oh, no, he, wow, here's here the go. thing that honestly is, is my, my bigger concern with rabbit. So it's fine in terms of if you, and I think it's updated the models because it uses perplexity under the hood. Um, and perplexity is an open AI partner. So it's using the open AI APIs. So you can have access to whatever model it wants to give you access to. Um, so asking it general questions, that's okay. The thing is with the Uber and the DoorDash and the Spotify stuff, how that works. And this, this was not properly explained or if it was, I didn't pay attention until I got it is that what they have you do is is when you go to this like whole dot rabbit dot tech thing and rabbit hole is, is a cute is a cute thing they're like okay log into these services to connect your accounts well I go to log into the services and I notice I'm like huh I'm on my retina macbook pro and and this this text doesn't look super retina something's off also why is my password manager not auto filling my spotify credentials oh well, it turns out I'm not actually logging into a Spotify login, um, you know, through an OAuth connector as I would expect. But instead, um, they've hidden a, 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 a VM using a, a web VNC client. So I'm actually logging into some random computer in the cloud with my credentials. Oh, and that's no. how it's giving it access to my things. Right. And and then security people were able to pop some of uh some of those containers, not the ones where you log in apparently with your credentials, but they were able to log into some of the ones, I guess, where it's supposed to be doing the ordering of the Uber or the DoorDash or what have you. And um, and that that makes me pause very much. It goes, okay, um, I don't know how secure your cloud stuff is. And, and I am going to guess that you have not spent a lot of money on, on security because you did this thing in six months. So of course you haven't, uh, but I... Uh, no, they're not getting my Uber credentials. There's no way I would even attempt to order an Uber with it. No. They have made uh, raised $30 million to make the device. 60. 60, 60. sorry. 60. Uh, they sold uh, a quite a few, what, a million of them? They sold a lot of them, right? They sold a lot. They sold a lot because I was in the very first batch. So like I got mine. I didn't get mine as quickly as the people who, and I'm at 16%. I don't know if that means charging or if that's what they're downloading an update. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I got, I didn't get mine as fast as the people who were at like the launch event in New York, but I got it within a couple of days of that. Um, and, um, and I was in the first batch, but they have many, many more batches of people. They were. I tried to order it, last week. and I'm so glad that it, when I tried to order it, it was in the first round, and they the the site didn't work. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> I never yeah, tried again. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. No, I I was I was able to get mine, and 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 I got a year of perplexity pro for free out of it, which is so you can't really value. complain because that's normally twenty dollars oh, a complaining. month. That's two hundred forty bucks. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's more than you paid. Right. Correct. So I'm, so I'm I'm you got a deal. I've justified it in my. I just find myself plus I get like a, a toy from my like my my graveyard collection of tech right yeah, like this exactly. is going to be <laughs> the, the city is me from having to buy it um later right um but for people who really thought that it was going to be exactly what it showed off or didn't understand 
you know, like the, the the nature of these sorts of projects, I can understand how they feel misled. What's concerning to me, and and some of this is anecdotal, but some of this is actually based on real stuff, is that I know at least as of 10 days ago, if you canceled your order, they would refund people fairly quickly. Uh, but a friend of mine, she ordered one and she tried to cancel her order and there's been no response. And there've been anecdotal re reports that I've seen on Reddit that they're not really being responsive to the to the order cancellations now. Um, I can't speak to any of that. I can't speak to my personal friend who, you know, when Ashley told me, oh yeah, I emailed them to cancel, haven't heard anything. That that makes me a little bit more concerned. Um, maybe they've had more cancellations than, I ex than they expected. I don't know, um, but... Yeah, I mean, it's not a scam, but it's also not a, not what it was sold as. Look, Going I, back to our comments about AI and trust. Correct. And how important trust. it is. Yep. Here's an example in again a, in of a, something coming out that's not quite what it was. In a way, this is too bad. And I think the Google f failings with the, the AI overview is too bad. A lot of this, because I think there is real promise. Maybe I'm wrong, yes. but I think there's real promise no, I think with there is. AI. I think we've already seen some amazing uses of it. I think that potentially AI could be amazing for human beings in so many ways. Uh, it's very easy. We've seen it happen before to fall into an AI winter where people throw up their hands, give up and move on. And I would hate to see these scams and failures chase people away from AI because I think the Agreed. potential is so great. So isn't there a risk uh, with all of this that, that we are going to scare people away from something that is potentially very good? I don't think so. No? I think people will just come back when they feel like it works. When there's something. Oh, by the way, how do I sound? We lost internet. There's a severe thunderstorms here and uh -oh. so on my phone. No, you're tether you're, you're breaking up a little bit. I saw you dropped off. So your power's out yes. right now? We have power, lost internet. Just the internet. That's yes. interesting. So I will talk slowly yes. just to make sure that I <laughs> so can So all the clear. packets arrive. Thank you. Yes. So when people feel that it's cooked, then they can feel that they can come back to it. I think no matter what you can avoid AI, it will be sprinkled in through all of whatever the, tech. The internet's so, made a choice. Um, or the, I, I think people will just wait. The tech sector's made yes. a choice, yeah. All right, good. I hope that's true. Elon says AI is going to take all our jobs, though, so. <laughs> that's fine. I, I hope he's right. You know what I want to do? I want to wake up all day and do art. Um, That's what I want to do. He's uh, He was speaking at a pet tech conference in Paris, Viva Tech 2024. Uh, he says, probably none of us will have a job. It, he didn't give us a time frame. If you want to do a job, that's kind of like a hobby, says Elon. You can do a job, but otherwise AI and the robots will provide any goods and services that you want. Now, okay, so I don't work, so I have no money. He says, oh, well, there needs to be a universal high income, not to be confused with universal basic income. I don't know where this money comes from. Right, where does this money come from? Is it all just self-perpetuating? <laughs> He's not alone. I just saw somebody else say that uh, in the next year, 50% of all jobs will disappear. In um, the next year? Well, let me see if I can find uh, find that story. I think it was... That seems awfully optimistic. Yeah, in 2025, so. that's almost next year. I think that's next year. Yeah. Uh 50% of all jobs will disappear. Uh, let me see who said this. Elon Musk. N probably, right? It was somebody uh, it was somebody I thought was fairly in intelligent. That'll um, make him happy because then he won't have to hire um, people just to lay them off. Yeah, again, that's right? really what Elon wants. He doesn't he, Elon doesn't want people. Some say I'm 10 sure years. the Google search would give a good answer. That's the problem. I can't seem to find this article that I just read. I should have. Uh, I should have booked. So you need recall. It. Yeah. <laughs> Gold. Maybe Full it's. Circle. Oh, maybe it's Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs predicts 300 million jobs will be lost or degraded by artificial intelligence. This was last year, so it hasn't happened in a year. I don't know. That's oh, how many God. people they want to lay off. 
Yeah. Yeah, they I mean, wish 300 million. They wish they could. Look at how they much money they could. Look at how look, look at how much money we'll save if we can just lay off all these people. They'll never forget it. No, never mind about the fact that that means no one will be able to buy your goods or services that you're selling. Right. But but just think of the pure profit potential if we just get rid of all these pesky employees. <laughs> so, I want to I want to go back to the the Elon quote and the idea about jobs as hobbies. There's a an author named um Ada Palmer which is actually one of the reasons why the name Ada came back into my life. And it's one of the reasons why my daughter's named Ada. Oh, um, she wrote a, a book series called Terra Ignata, I G N O T A. And in this series, if I remember correctly, there are people called vokers who are big on having a vocation. This is a post scarcity society in some ways. And so these are people that like to do a lot more work than they're required to by society because they find it to be personally fulfilling. And so there's a lot of science fiction out there that already digs into this question. Yeah, but it, in the case of, of uh, Ada Palmer, it's 2454. It's not next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Leo. I'm not going to lie. I have never looked at Goldman Sachs as the next Oracle of Delphi. Okay, you're right. You're right. And if it happens, they can't by, even figure out where interest rates are going. But you actually, it isn't unreasonable to wonder what's going to happen um, over the next ten, let's say ten years, not one year, but over the next ten years with AI and jobs. Um, isn't it the case that AI could do a lot of these jobs, right? Yes. Yes. Even I, our I mean, jobs. Go back. Go yeah. back to my no. dad's time. At, I'm at a company, no. no. At a company called CH. <laughs> go ahead. At a, at a company called uh, I think it was CH2M Hill when he worked there, they had like a typing pool and they had people that were paid to like right. help with the production of documents. Right. All of those jobs were absorbed into word processors, computers, and yep. so forth. And so I think we're going to see not the elimination of jobs, but instead people's productivity in certain areas be greatly increased, limiting the need for human inputs for those jobs, and thereby reducing the total number of slots needed to get the same amount of work done. So AI is going to enhance humans and replace some jobs, but not replace humans, I think, entirely. So that's, that's the way I see things going, but it probably not the pace people are are hoping if they're counting EPS more than the quality of human life. Well, here's the good news. If AI takes our jobs, at least we'll have more time to game. Um, uh, I think <laughs> I'm going to change the subject now from AI. <laughs> well, you're all, by the way, I'm back right? online. Oh, good. I'm it back online. Back. Yes. The yes. internet's supposed Sorry to survive that. thunderstorms. I thought, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, especially fiber. It's underground. Yeah. What the heck? Um, are you a gamer, Wesley? I know that the, these two are. I'm a cell phone gamer. I'm a casual Stats gamer. Stats I, I, doesn't count. Boo, and, yeah, and Alex is not going to be a gamer anymore. Uh, he's going to have two kids. He's got and two so kids. How does you'll he see. find time? You'll see. He's he's oh, talking about buying another a second game, and he's running his own biz and he's running his own business. I mean, come on, no, you no, will no, not I, have time. I have solved the problem that you are describing, which is entitled not getting enough sleep. That's my solution. The children go to bed. Well, the baby one right now goes to bed. The spouse goes to bed. I put the dogs to bed. And then from that moment on until midnight is Alex time. Oh, and what are you playing these days? Oh, Leo, what a lovely question. Thank you for asking me. There is an amazing <laughs> game called Dyson Sphere Program uh, made by a group of folks over in China called, I think, like, Use Cat Studio or something. It is a factory automation game in which you build these awesome multi, like, um, solar system factories, and it is insanely good. I have a hook line. System. Is it like I Factorio or one of those kind of? It's. Factorio with better graphics. Yeah. I would say much better quality of life and also much more like going around the universe and doing stuff. It's, it's, I, guys, this game is amazing. It's cheap. Play it. It's All right. Good. It's on Steam. Uh, yes. And, and the reviews are overwhelming. Can I play it on my, can I, Go ahead. I was going to say, can I play this on my Steam Deck? Uh, I wouldn't. Because you build, eventually you build like multiple Dyson spheres and you're flying around. It, it, it does get eventually. You need CPU a big heavy. screen. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah, this, but this I can is... use that on another thing too. Okay. Try it. I mean, I'm sure. There, no, I'll, I'll play it on my gaming PC. That's fine. I was just asking because I, as you like to, when I can play on my Steam Deck, I, I, I prefer to do that. If I, I can. thought, totally. Christina, you might be an animal, animal well fan. Have you played that yet? This is off, claimed by many to be the game of the year. It's got very difficult puzzles, you know. 
Oh. Mm. I, I mean, I'm, I'm into the aesthetic already, though. Yeah, it's an 8-bit side scroller, uh, but it's got uh, interesting uh, puzzles, difficult puzzles. Anyway, I was just wondering. I, I've been reading a lot about that. I always look for recommendations for uh, things to do from you, Christina, shows to watch. I've been watching, uh, I have to say, I just watched two episodes of Ripley last night on Netflix. That is the most beautiful black and white. It's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. You, Very pretty. Um, it reminds me of a Hitchcock in the sense that there's a lot of it does. ominous feeling. <laughs> but so far, nothing ominous has happened. <laughs> well, I'm I'm a massive fan of the, um, the talented Anthony Mr. Mangala, Ripley. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, the talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah, yeah. And that's what that. So, so for me, like I, I have mixed feelings about the Netflix adaptation, but I, I for me, it got better as it got along. Good. I mm -hmm. actually kind of going back to sort of going back to gaming. Best TV show I've seen this year, genuinely, Fallout. is Fallout. Fallout, yeah, yeah, yes. pretty amazing, yeah, yeah. Uh, a jury has handed Bungie as a landmark victory. Uh, cheating software, the jury decided, violates copyrights. Now it's not a massive ton, uh, sum. They they awarded Bungie sixty three thousand dollars. They found that Phoenix Digital, which owns the cheat mod site Aim Junkies, is guilty of violating copyrights by creating cheats for Destiny 2 and awarded them $63,000. Not enough probably to stop other companies from doing this, but this is the first time DMCA has been used to protect a video game from cheats. I'm torn about this one. Same. Yeah. I don't... Because uh, you cause like it feels cheating? Like, no, I like Destiny 2. I've played a lot of that. I used to have a whole crew that I played with and we would get stomped by people who were actually good. Right. Um, <laughs> or by people who were using cheats. Well, now I'm now I'm kind of thinking about why we were getting owned so hard. But I, I'll just say that it doesn't feel like an, a proper application of copyright law. Yes. Yeah, it's the DMCA, I, I, which is the problem, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because cause my thought on this is like, on the one hand, I'm actually like, I think that the cheats and things like this, when they're used in online play, actually really detract from the experience for everyone. If you want to do it on your own and if it's like your own local thing, I don't care. Right. Like mod, mod to your heart's content. I'm actually very pro game modding. Uh, again, going back to Fallout, right? Like that's a, that I think I love, I love game mods, but I think when it starts to interfere like with online play, especially with something like Destiny, not, not a fan. Having said that, like, like you, I don't know. Like the DMCA seems like a weird use case for this. And I'm not super comfortable with having this being like, oh, well, this is a, a copyright thing. Like it just, it, it, I don't like it. Right. Cause it sounds like it would actually make modding illegal and possibly Correct. legally uh, dangerous and financially dangerous, which is dumb because game mods, as you said, are fantastic. And anyone who's played a game and modded it knows why. Right. Like I mean, Gary's anything, mod, you add, right? like Or even Counter-Strike without, you know, Half Life, there is no Counter Strike right. without mods, or like mods for Baldur's Gate three or Crusader right. Kings or whatever. You know, I mean, in, in, in many cases, those mods like give the games life and, and give them far broader communities and bring people into them and and can sell more copies, frankly, than what you would have otherwise. Because a lot of times the modders fix stuff that the developers who don't have time because they've moved on to another project or because you know it, it's difficult for them to do it. Like they can fix stuff that other people can't. They could also get around IP. So, for example, in Crusader yes. Kings 3, there is a uh, Game of Thrones mod that <laughs> oh, Paradox fun. Games yeah. could never make oh, because they would never be able to afford it. Right. The people who are making that as a, as a fan-based, uh, like literally full rebuild of the game, have made fantastic. something that is that is ludicrously fantastic. Anthony mm, Nielsen asks in our uh, Discord if this could be used against emulators as well. I guess it could. It, that we are in a golden age of emulators now that Apple's allowing emulators on iOS. Finally. Yeah, this is huge. Well, Did, the emulator well, the, case law is pretty settled. Um, is uh, okay. There's Bleem. Yeah, yeah. There, there were two lawsuits. Yeah. There was Bleem and there was Virtual Disk Station. They were both PlayStation uh, mods. One was for uh, PC. One was for uh, Mac. And in both cases, Sony lost pretty di resolutely. Um, now the lawsuit still bankrupted both of those companies, but the but the case law for emulation is is pretty solid. Now the, the where people get into problems is how you distribute ROMs and other things, but the emulation itself is is I think a pretty did settled you, issue. Uh, did fact, you see how uh, 
Did you see the Copilot Microsoft uh, Minecraft demo uh, at Surface? Or you were probably busy were preparing for a build. I was busy, so I, I, I no, I, I saw, I saw like I, I guess it in, in the highlight, like that certainly is like a, a what an interesting a, use of AI. I mean, talk about getting totally. the, the young people comfortable with AI. You can use AI to help you in Minecraft to show you a digital assistant that could show you. Give you tips, show it's you great, how to build great stuff. Great use case, honestly. Yeah, I if love it works, it. if it works, that that actually could be. I mean, because how oftentimes do many of us, when we're playing any of our games, you know, we have like a, a browser next to us and we're typing things in. And <laughs> All the time, we're, we're going through YouTube videos. And maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just bad at games. Fair, but like no, you know, we're like no. walking through the walkthroughs and we're like trying to figure things out. If I could get that while I'm doing the game, yeah. You know how I know Christina. it's not just you. There was a huge market. For those game walkthrough when there were books, remember you would buy the game and the book. Yes, because otherwise, yes, I, I had them. Yeah. They were great. Yeah, this is why I have my iMac next to my gaming PC, yes. so that way I have Correct. a separate machine. So when I get Correct. to a puzzle in a game, and I because I have By children, the way, I don't have a lot of time. An excellent use for your five thousand dollar truly iPad yes. Pro. <laughs> We've sold You're it. absolutely not even wrong. We we, this them. is what it is. The, 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 the spend spend three thousand dollars on your iPad Pro so you can like get walkthroughs. Oh, I keep games. the Valheim yeah, wiki open at all times as I'm playing. Absolutely. <laughs> because you couldn't use a Fire tablet that costs four dollars. <laughs> absolutely thing. not. No, you no, need no, no, the no. M4 chip. All right, we are going to take a break and then it's time for our IPs. Actually, one more gaming story that I think is kind of interesting nostalgically. Atari is buying in television, ending the longest running <laughs> gaming Ever. platform feud of all time. Uh, you had an Atari or you had an Intellivision, now Atari, which is, by the way, done very well with nostalgia, keeping keeping uh, nostalgia alive. Uh, uh, uniting Atari and Intellivision after 45 years ends the longest running console war <laughs> in history. I guess because it was probably had to be the original one, right? Like, yeah, yeah you had a 2600, Mattel, you had an Intellivision. Yeah, in 1979, Mattel released the Intellivision, which competed directly against Atari's 2600. Uh, Intellivision sold an estimated 5 million units all told. I think it's probably safe to say that uh, Atari won that Atari one. won, yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my, my dad had, an, well, I think we had both, but we had an Intellivision. I remember, you know, it came out before I was born. And so my the first console I remember is, is the original Nintendo. But when I was in third grade, I, I in some closet buried someplace, I found the Intellivision box. Wow. I was like, what is this thing? Wow. And then, I, then I, I couldn't get it connected because it didn't have like an RF cable or anything. I think I did eventually find a way to get it connected to a TV. And my dad used to rave about how great the football game on it was. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about because I have a Super Nintendo now. And and I I, I don't know why, why you were so obsessed with this thing, but he loved his television. That's so funny. All right, let's take a little break. And then we're going to talk about uh, the well, I guess this would have fit into the end of the line for some some history and technology in just a little bit. But first, a word from our sponsor. The beginning uh, of the line for a great customer experience. I'm talking about In Touch CX. Customer experience has changed dramatically thanks to modern tools, and In Touch CX can do it. They know that a major goal of your company is to give your customers an excellent customer experience, right? InTouch CX works with some of the biggest brands around the world to apply AI and smart automation to optimize the customer experience, to make it better for your customers and better for you, for every touch point across the entire customer journey. To provide a great customer experience, companies have to depend on a combination of talented people, we're not dealing the people out, efficient processes, and the latest innovative technology. Quality service only happens when you have the right mix of these things working together. Unfortunately, most companies provide poor customer service, not because they don't have a great team, but because they're dealing with outdated, complex systems. The team doesn't have the tools they need. That makes it hard to meet customer needs and hard, frankly, to retain your customer service agents. Let's make customer interaction better. Customer interaction should be smooth for both sides, for your customers and your company's agents. That's why InTouch CX improves the experience for both the agent and your customers at every touch point of their journey. And they do it 
using innovative AI and automation. We don't deal the people out. We just help them be better. InTouch CX is an advisor you can rely on and trust to elevate your customer and agent experience and to add AI and automation at every touch point. You gotta, they have so many tools. I can't cover it all in one ad, but if you talk to the people at InTouch CX, as I did, I think you'll be very, very impressed. Whatever your company's size, regardless of where your company is on its customer experience journey, InTouch CX can help. Here's what you do. Go to InTouchCX.com slash twit. You can sign up for a free, no obligation consultation. They'll really talk with you about what your pain points are and what they can do to help. And they will create a tailored customer support strategy for AI and smart automation customized for your specific business. InTouchCX.com slash twit. Really great people who are transforming the customer experience globally. InTouchCX.com slash twit. We mentioned the end of the line for ICQ. That's coming up at end of next month. Uh, Congress just uh, made the end of the line for the Elon Musk jet tracker. You may remember oh, Jack God. Sweeney, the uh, college student at University of Florida who created the uh, Elon Jet Twitter account in 2020. Uh, Elon always hated it. He called it assassination coordinates, right? Shadow banned Sweeney, then fully banned him. By the way, he's back on X for some reason. Taylor Swift constantly dogged by complaints about her incessant air travel. Watch this video, which is hysterical. This is, Taylor has two private jets. This is the right. year 2023. They're making some stops. Uh, looks like Kansas City uh, there in the middle. I don't know. Uh, all over the, <laughs> the, the jets are going on like crazy. And the reason that we could do this is because the tail numbers are public. Are public knowledge right uh a lawyer for swift served jack sweeney with a cease and desist order earlier this year elon as you know has been you know tried to buy it try to do anything he could to stop it uh well congress has intervened and now it's <laughs> all, all over by the way a, a rare bipartisan vote the first, the amendment in the federal aviation administration reauthorization bill passed last week allows private aircraft owners to anonymize their registration information. The tail number will no longer be associated with your name. Uh, the bill was signed into law on May 16th. Get this, pass the Senate. Nothing passes the Senate. 88 to 4. This one did. Pass the House. 387 to 26. There was unanimity, practically. <laughs> God bless America. <laughs> uh, no they're more like, jet They're tracking. like, absolutely. They're like, nobody can do this anymore. Even though, and it's so funny, like, obviously, this this kid popularized this. But at least for Taylor Swift, I, I don't know about anyone else. This practice had been very common in, in the fandom for quite a long time. Sure. Like, they're... Like, no, 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 no. Like there were tumblers dedicated to this like yeah. for a decade. Um, and it was gross and it was creepy. And I always found it a gross and creepy. That said, I was also like, but it's legal. And, you know, why Why should your tail number be allowed to be private? Um, I, I there's, a, there's a part of me, a cynical part that wonders, oh, do the politicians just not want to have their jets tracked? Uh, yes, partially that. The Supreme Court, for example, uh, and some billionaire friends. But here's the thing. If you don't want to be tracked, don't fly private. If you want to, or, fly or private, pay, right, or or fly through net jets, like like right. Or yeah. if you're a tailor and you have two jets um, and you fly around in them, people might notice because we have an open database of this sort of thing. Right. There was no problem here. There were people making decisions inside of a market, and I find it gross that the billionaires have complained and Congress has snapped to attention, <laughs> like right. private at the end of boot camp and gone okay. <laughs> Cool. Oh, this is terrible. Absolutely. <laughs> right. But if a cop kicks down my door and shoots me, it's no, my right. No, no. right. Correct. Correct. Yeah. The problem and to be is clear, my bank yeah. account lacks some zeros. Right. Right. We, we, we're, we're not part of this. And to be clear, like I, you know, have, I've thought like the, the Twitter account existing, I, I, I never had a problem with him kicking the kid off of Twitter. I never had a problem with that. Right. Like I think that if you're saying I don't want people who share this sort of information, that's my terms of service. Fine. Uh, is it hypocritical if you talk about how much you care about free speech? Sure. But like uh, the whole thing with Elon Musk is, is hypocrisy. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, to me, like these, even though I, I personally find some of these services and people who do some of this tracking stuff, yeah, it can get kind of gross. I'm like, yeah, but that's how the law works, but not anymore. Not anymore because people uh, got embarrassed. Privacy yes. is a luxury item. That's really basically the, the bottom line of all of this. If you got the got the scratch, you can be private. Privacy. Privacy for those who can afford it. Exactly. So, Congress for those who can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best Congress money can buy. Don't you knock it. Yes. Spotify mm. is going to break every car thing it ever sold. They I have one. I'm so bad. Oh. So the idea was, tell us how this worked. It was for your car. There it is. Is that it? It was for, it was for your car. Yeah, this is it. It's not plugged in right now because um, it's not, but because um, I don't have a, enough USB-C things to power it. So it was for your car. I never used mine with my car. I got it for $30 when, or $20 when they were <laughs> on, uh, um, uh, like, I guess, closeout. But the idea would be you would plug it into your car. It basically would just be a remote control that connects to your, your iPhone or your Android and then have a great touch screen on it that had a really nice little wheel that you could turn to control things and a really nice way of interfacing with Spotify. Now, what I did with mine is I just connected it to my computer and used oh, it so yeah. a great way. It was way. like a little Spotify radio for your computer. Correct. Oh, that's cool. Right. It was just a great, like, always on thing. And what was great about it is, the, yes, it might be paired to my phone, but it could control wherever Spotify was playing. So Spotify is playing out of my computer speakers. Fantastic. I can see what's playing. I can scroll to the next thing. I don't have to bother with Spotify on my computer. I've just got this great little toy, but they're going to kill it. And I'm so mad at them. I'm so mad at them. I know I only paid $30 for it, but at least let us hack it. Like if you're going to do this, then I don't know, maybe this is what the EU should care about. Okay. Well, most why, people who bought it spent $90 on it. That's how much the list yes. was. They right. only made it yes. for a year. They stopped producing it a year, at, less than a year after it went on sale. Uh, now, two years later, they're going to turn off the servers December 9th, and that's it on your car thing. And no refund. And it's so dumb. Yeah. No refund. Nope. And then what bothers me is it's like, okay, you. I get it. You don't want to continue supporting this. Fine. Can you at least... I mean, maybe maybe this should be a thing the EU should focus on, right? We're like, oh, well, we we, we you know want to make sure that um, uh, there's there's no unfair business practices. Well, what about the unfair business practice of selling a device and then bricking it and then at, like just refusing to say, oh, well, we're not going to give you any way of of hacking this. Did you ever own a chumby? Yes, of course I did. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> Same thing happened to the chumby, which was like a little uh, hacky sack with a screen on it. It uh, was so dumb. <laughs> but you it know what? So dumb. Because they open sourced it, somebody picked it up. Right, the community came in. The community the, came in. Yeah. They're like, we we will have your your stupid little widgets available forever, and that would be great. Like, <laughs> why is Spotify bricking it? That's the thing. I'm I'm not clear. Oh on. well, they're saying that they just don't want to maintain the stuff anymore, and and it's all about like I guess solidifying their brand. They have a new. Here's what I really think it is. They just introduced a new font because they don't want to pay for the font licensing for the old fonts. And I bet that they can't remotely update the hardware. Oh my God. That is the lamest oh thing I've my, ever really? heard. And I used to work I mean, for this is equity. just my theory. This is just my theory. I have no idea if it's really about the font. That makes thing, perfect but, sense. But, but the font timing is the same thing. So this is just my completely, could be completely conspiratorial. Like I, I, I could be sharing bad information, but this is my pet theory, which is they were like, yeah, well, we don't have any way of, we don't want to, we don't want to update this to, to use the font that we don't pay for licensing for anymore. So infinite money for Joe Rogan, right? right. But not enough money to keep the hardware they sold you alive. Right. That hardware to me that is... was $90. I mean, I didn't pay that, but a lot of people did. So also, this is lame. This new font is called Spotify Mix. I never, I didn't understand. Now you've explained it, why they, why they had to have a font. Nobody else has their own personal font they were paying license well, fees for, yeah they're paying a license fee yeah. yeah so now what you could do in that case is you could just you know buy like perpetual rights yeah that's what we do on the do. twit website and we pay like 60 bucks a year or whatever to to use right. a and, special font yeah and and i don't know what the terms were on their particular font but i think that it was one of those where like because they have web apps and whatnot they were being charged for yeah anyway so they, they they created their own um and um i mean you know github we have our own font what we did though which was great oh was i i use the github it. font i love the it's github good. font yeah you open sourced it anybody can use it anytime we open sourced it. anybody yeah, can use free. it yeah and, and are you and, talking about monospace because i use this in yes. my uh, i love monospace it's a gorgeous yeah, font. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, Mona Space, and then we also have Mona Sands, and um, we also have like there there are a, a bunch of um, uh, options we have now. But yeah, the the GitHub fonts are, are open source. But it originally started; it was a font that we'd paid for, and then uh, we worked with that foundry to open source it because nice. we made some modifications, and we were like, okay, we're. But it's a great coding ethos. font. It's mono spaced. It's got uh, ligatures. I use it in Emacs and uh, and in my terminal as well. I really like mono. Love it. Yeah. And it's got like many, many, many families. It's a very uh, 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 flexible font. Yeah, well, maybe Spotify will release Mix. No, they won't. Never. <laughs> no, of course they won't. <laughs> but they'll do... Is, I, uh, sorry to talk over. Uh, I, I, I'm going to call this out because I see this all the time. They had layoffs. Yeah, and I can't layoffs. help to say that this is probably tied to this as well. They don't have the people to maintain the servers. Right. They don't have focus to be able to push things that are considered experimental or considered taking a chance. They they are just if, if it's not AI, that's the only thing that they're willing to 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 try to put any like well, specific focus on. But but I think that they don't have the people that made this. Last month, they, they Daniel Eck admitted that the twelve hundred people they lay off too many people off yeah. impacted the company, quote, more than anticipated. Uh yeah. really? They laid off. This is the kind of thing of that happens. Yeah, that's sad. Uh, by the way, a lot of those people got laid off because podcasts weren't making it, which is weird because they pay Joe Rogan hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Call her daddy got uh, I think twenty million a year for three years. Um, I, I think actually those shows probably do make money, just not enough money to support oh, yeah. the entire. Yeah, uh, but they're non-exclusive now. Yeah, uh, right. so. Right. The, the, so now they're trying audio books, which they're also trying to not fully pay, but I think is the reasonable market rate for. Correct. I, I love Spotify. I have been a Spotify user for so long, but the company kind of just always sucks slightly more than I think it should. <sighs> <sighs> I sound like a downer. It's a great service. Well, here's a bigger it. downer. The Doge has passed. Ka Kabosu, the side-eyeing Shiba Inu who inspired the Doge mean passed away this week at the age Aww. of 18. Oh, there she is. She inspired. She was a good girl. Yeah, she was a very good girl. Uh, her story's interesting. She was turned into a pound along with dozens of her uh, pound mates from a puppy mill, which went out of business. 19 Shiba Unos sent to a Japanese dog shelter after the shutdown of a puppy mill. She was adopted by a kindergarten teacher, Atsuko Sato, uh, to save her. She took her home. Sato created a blog. <laughs> I get the distinct feeling Sato, uh, basically this is her whole family. Um, and uh, the rest is history. You can actually still see uh, the blog right here with pictures of a Kabosa. Aww. Oh, Kab Kab Kabosu, Kabosu. What a good, what, what a, a good, good doggy. Eighteen years old. She'd been sick for some time. Um, 18's a, that's a good, eighteen is a good, good long life for a dog. That's yeah. ins, that, that's like very high end. And of, how of loved the, the was this thing. dog? Right. I mean, so loved. Yeah. I tell you, it makes so, me want to get one. She, but you know, also the uh, this inspiration for Dogecoin. Uh, in fact, mm -hmm. I think Dogecoin had her picture on the Dogecoin. And there are a few people who made some money on the, on the Doge. So I'm not one of them. I for, I yeah. didn't sell mine in time. I was I was it's all about timing. It, well, no, because it happened right when the peak happened, right when my nephew was born, and I was so preoccupied with that, Shoot. Um, which uh, that, that I that I didn't sell. And um, yeah, anyway, much, it is what. How it much is. do you have still? Oh, I don't know. I think I have like five or six hundred dollars worth. But it would have, at one time was it worth thousands? Oh yeah, one time it was worth thousands. I mean, look, I I still for the most part I made some money off of it, but I but I would have made more. I've lost like three hundred dollars. Didn't like, Father Robert care. make quite a bit of money? He sold, I think, at the right time. No, he sold it way early. Oh, he sold it too early. Ah, oh, it's too bad. He found more. I think he made some money, but the problem is he's not allowed to make money. He's a Jesuit priest working at the Vatican. Whatever he makes has to go to the church, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> well. Uh, how much? How much do you have, John? How, Twenty thousand Doge coins. Is that like a lot of money, or is that like four cents, John? I'm not sure what the conversion is right bucks. now. Not bad, but probably worth 
tens of thousands at one time at the peak. That was the that was the meme that Elon tanked, right? Yeah. Yep. Does Twit does the Twit Club take Doge? Do you guys take crypto for uh, your thing? <laughs> we okay. So there's a sad, sad story there, which was before the club, we had a tip jar like everybody did back in the day. And at one point, about 15 years ago, I said, hey, we should take Bitcoin. So I started taking Bitcoin and have accumulated now 7.85 Bitcoin in the tip jar. But at some point, I forgot the password. <laughs> so, Leo. <laughs> so Leo, honey, I no. have roughly, what is that, $400,000 <laughs> worth of Bitcoin that I can't access. So we stopped with the we stopped with the crypto. We only take American dollars. That that's amazing, and it's also why I don't feel bad about having started to cover Bitcoin back when it was like fifty dollars. Because one of two things would have happened if I had purchased some: I would have sold it for seventy five, or mm -hmm. I would have lost it and had zero. But there's no way I would have managed to. I, it was like back no. in the box days, you know? No, it was. Well, it was so so what would have happened to you would have been what happened to me, which was I, I first wrote about it when it was like $10 a coin or something. And then I was first told that I had to, if I ever, for, for the, you know, Wait mere appearance of impropriety, <laughs> you have to get rid chart. of it. <laughs> you found it. Is <laughs> there a password the on there anywhere, Wesley? Is there or is that just a lid? <laughs> That's the actual plastic uh, tip jar that we had in the studio. Fantastic. There wasn't, Fantastic. There wasn't any Bitcoin in that. So no, but, well, don't I, feel I had, bad. To, yeah, don't feel bad. Six days ago, mine, Alex. May 22nd is Bitcoin Pizza Day. Oh, yeah. This is the oh, anniversary yeah. of the day. A Florida man paid 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas. <laughs> it was the first Bitcoin transaction. Uh, in 2010, it wasn't that long ago, 14 years ago, he uh, arranged to get two Papa John's pizzas for what would today be worth, what is it, $680 million, something like that? <laughs> Jeez, God. That, that hurts my soul. It yeah. does. It's like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like that hurts even more than like the fact that if you really want to be awesome, to be doubly depressed, just think about how much inflation has has increased the the, the price of like Papa John's pizza. Well, oh honestly, years. even even two dollars is too much to pay for Papa John's you're, pizza. You're you're not even remotely <laughs> wrong. But, but now two of them, it's it's forty five dollars minimum. It's forty five oh dollars, and uh, yeah, so yeah. I the problem with with everything that I deliver now to my house is that I always somehow spend like a hundred dollars to have delivery. I don't know how everything yeah. became so expensive. Everything's a hundred dollars now. Just everything. Just yeah. Everything. It's a hundred dollars at least. Yes. Here is the uh the posting from uh, twenty ten. This guy was celebrating. I just want to report I successfully traded ten thousand bitcoins for a pizza. Thanks, Jerkos. Congratulations, Laszlo. A great milestone reached. Boy, that age like milk. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, look, we all thought that it was going to be worth like a fraction of a, of, a, of a cent, right? right? That was the whole thing. So in his mind, he's like, hey, who cares? It took me 20 minutes to mine this. I might as well use this for, for something. No one's going to be dumb enough to actually use this as currency. People still don't. Because it has like no, I mean, three transactions no, it, per month. Right. Correct. Be because of the, because of how expensive it is to, to do the the transactions and whatnot, yeah. Gas fees. Yeah, so if you want to use Bitcoin, it's like mailing gold. It's kind of inefficient and silly. One uh, yes. final note: uh, the, the, one of the creators of the personal computer, a uh, man who made uh, mm. many computers, uh, mini computers for digital equipment, Gordon Bell, passed away this week at the age of eighty nine. Uh, founded the Real computer one. mystery computer museum, a beautiful computer history museum down the peninsula, uh, some years oh, I've ago. Been there. Yeah, it's beautiful. I interviewed him many years ago. Uh, he, because his wife Gwen, who co-founded the museum with him, uh, uh, had Alzheimer's. He realized the importance of you know kind of remembering anything. And I don't know if you met him in the day when he would wear a camera around his neck. He. Uh, that was recording every few seconds, everything he did with the idea, this is way ahead of his time. The idea of, you know, having some sort of repository of, of everything that happened. He didn't have the AI at the time to analyze it. No, he had the limitless pen. Like the, he was doing the he limitless, had the pen limitless pen before. before it was uh, around. He or total recall. Yeah. He called, Oh yeah. Right. He called it, uh, <laughs> the mem memo, 
I can't remember what he had a name for it. Uh, when I interviewed him, he was wearing it. Um, anyway, the, the late Gordon Bell was a great engineer, uh, uh, research, uh, researcher. He, he worked at digital equipment, became, uh, he opened uh, Microsoft's first research lab, uh, joined the Microsoft Research Silicon Valley Lab in full time in 1995. Oh, it was called My Life Bits, a database designed to capture all of his life's information in a cloud based digital database in 1995. Damn, look at you, Gordon. Ahead of the curve. Yep. Well, I mean, digital equipment is one of those companies like the, most people don't know um, because you know, Compaq bought them and then it, it, whatnot, but like they were really, from what I have heard, only after the fact, but from what I understand, um, you would uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Leo, but like they really were at the forefront of a lot oh, of absolutely. the early. They were the know, first, they were the stuff. Vaxes, the first mini computers. Uh, they were, that it was huge. Um, they call a datamation called him the Frank Lloyd Wright of computers. He was a computer architect at the very beginning of the, uh, of the computer era. Gordon Bell. Great man. And I very much enjoyed interviewing him many years ago. I think it's on our triangulation somewhere. Oh, cool. That brings us to the close of a fascinating, fun, and I'm not surprised, twit, thanks to the great Christina Warren. Love talking to you. Every time we can get you on, we will. Christina is a senior developer advocate at GitHub. Uh, film girl at film underscore get girl on all social networks. And uh, I was going to talk to you about Shein and Timu, but we'll have to save that for another day. Save it for the next one. Because, yeah. yeah, Louise we, we can, we can talk a about a great piece <laughs> on a big technology about how they snuck up on Amazon. Mostly, interestingly, uh, Timu by buying ads in middle sized markets, not major markets. Huh. Yeah. Kind of an interesting it's, strategy. That's interesting. Clever strategy. Thank you, Christine. Anything you want to plug? Anything you're up to these days? No, I mean, you know, um, uh, the GitHub YouTube channel, um, I, I do uh, content there um, uh, just about every week. So youtube.com slash GitHub, check that out. Um, but um, yeah. Good. We love Christina. It's always great to have you on. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for having me. YouTube.com slash GitHub. Uh, Mr. Wesley Faulkner, always a pleasure. Can't tell you who he works for. But I can tell you he's at Wesley83 on the Mastodon. So, so nice to have you on. Anything you want to plug? Your chickens? Anything? I, I have a shout out that I would like to yes. say. Um, so shout out. I'm on another podcast. Um, one of the others is it's called Community Pulse. We talk about community and developer relations. And um, I was one of my co-hosts. We had um, he works for. Um, another company I won't say, but, uh, his name is Jason hand and he's a great guy. And great we guy. were, he was asking me like, what am I doing this week? And I was told him I was going to be on twit. And he said, if you get on twit, please make sure you say Leo Laporte, you had a marketed effect on <laughs> my journey through tech. Nice. You, you, you helped change my life. You helped like you were there since, you know, back in the day when you're on cable and he, he felt like he had a kinship with you. And, um, I wanted to, he, he, he asked me if I would be willing to share that with you. And I said, of course, I need, he, he's like, and I, I also want to like double down on that and saying like, um, Aww. being on the show is, you know, is a huge bucket li list check item for me, but also, um, for those who, um, I think Jason represents is that you, touch a lot of lives not just now but way back then and all the 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 years um between and um wanted to make sure that you understand how much you mean oh. not only to me but so to so many people out that's there. so sweet well thank you i'm gonna break down into tears you must work with him christina because he's a i used to i used to work with him advocate. actually yeah I Microsoft. used to work with Jason Hand. Yeah. I, I worked with him for a number of years. He's a fantastic guy. So shout out to Jason Hand and also nice. plus one to everything he said. Aw. Yeah. Golly, makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, hi, Jason. And uh, thank you, Wesley, yes. for the very kind words. That's really... You're welcome. Really, really By the sweet. way, what you are talking about um, uh, the person that died. Um, Gordon Bell. And yeah. I want to get to... Gordon Bell. I want to get to the age when when I die, no one asks what I died of. So that's... 
Oh yeah, we that's, didn't ask where I He go. was yeah. eighty nine. Yeah, like eighty nine. It's pretty much <laughs> <Yeah>. obvious. <laughs> he died. We were, we were like, we were, we were like, congratulations. That's yeah, actually that's, yeah. A, like, yeah. that's a good run. Like the Sheena Ibu, he had a good run. You yes. know? Yeah, you didn't say, oh, ooh, there he bungee is. jumping. Oh, okay. is that a yeah. triangulation episode? Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, great Gordon Bell. What a character. And that you can't see it, but around his neck, he's wearing that camera that uh, records everything that happens in his life. Uh, well, thank you. That was very nice of you. I appreciate it, Wesley. It's really, honestly, I feel very privileged to get to be hang with people like you and Christina and uh, Alex. I am the lucky one. I have a I have a very blessed life to get to know people like you. In fact, I thank Stacy every time I see her for introducing us. I appreciate it. Mr. Alex Wilhelm, who is caretaking my home, my family home for me. He's living out in the back. It's very nice that you're doing that. He has launched a brand new enterprise. And everybody, I hope everybody listening to the show is now subscribed to CautiousOptimism.News. I know I have. I was going to take Wesley's very kind words and turn them around and say rude things about you. Yeah, you I wish you me. would. But since you since you started off as something lovely, I feel like Aww. now it would just be like uh, unthankful. Aww. Um, we go back no, a long way, long enough we, for you to have absolute scorn and disdain for me. No, what's interesting about just thinking about Twit over the years is just how long I've been coming by and how consistent you've been, Leo. Aww. Because I, I've done podcasting for a while. You've done podcasting for a while. 20 years, baby. And it's hard to stay as on point as time goes on. And somehow every time I come on Twit, you have good energy. And that's not easy. So 10 points to you. Thank you. Again, and you have more hair than me, so minus ten points. To you. <laughs> the, the key <laughs> is surrounding yourself with great people. Not only the people on camera, but the people behind the scenes. Kevin King filling in for Benito Gonzalez this week. Thank you, Kevin, our studio manager, Jammer B. And honestly, the best thing about Twit is the full community, not just the people who are on our panels, but all the people who watch and listen, who participate with the show in our Discord, or members of Club Twit. We really. Um, the community is what it's all about. And I feel totally blessed. I, uh, from the days we did the screensavers, uh, we've been able to have a great community of geeks and nerds, and I've been able to participate in it. And uh, that is a blessing, absolute blessing. Thank you. I know you. it's Alex's time. I don't, I don't want to just, I put it, but Alex's, my first twit, Alex and I drove to Petaluma together. Really? Yes. And just, so, and then oh, we connected really? that way. I didn't yeah. Know that. Oh my gosh. And then, and then Christina and I, you know, we 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 still like hang out every once in a while. Nice. Um, I was uh, Christina Milanese at uh, South, South by Southwest as well. Carolina, um, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Carolina yeah. Milanese, and then like Amy Webb. I mean, it just feels like it's your community that it's you built. It's a great here is community. Just, it, it's it's amazing, isn't it? It is it's super smart community. people who are really genuinely interesting and interested. And uh, what a blessing you all are. Thank you. So I'll right back at you. Okay. Except for you, Alex. <laughs> That's totally reasonable. I, I I wouldn't hang out with me either. So no, no I love good. you, Alex. In fact, the next time I'm in Rhode Island, I'm not. I'm coming up, knock on your door, and uh, just taking you out. Give me like a two hour warning. I will. I will take you out to any <laughs> restaurant in town and buy you lunch. I just want to see the babies uh, and Liza, your you, beautiful wife. You have a good life, Alex, in a very nice house. <laughs> yes, we've been working nice. on it. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. We love doing Twit. I am uh, very lucky to be able to spend this time with you, and thank you. Uh, if you uh, like the show, please join the club. That's what's going to keep this show on the air. It's the only thing at this point that can keep this show going. I know I'm ready. Are you? Twit.tv slash club twit. We do the show every Sunday afternoon, 2 to 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. That's 5 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that is 2100 UTC. You can watch us do it live on YouTube youtube.com slash twit slash live for all of our shows. That's where the live streams live. Uh, of course, Club Twit members get to watch not just during the show, but before and after as well. Uh, there's often some fun stuff before and after there was today. Um, you can also get the show on the uh, uh, website at twit.tv. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to This Week in Tech. Look at all that. Look at all the ways you can get it. You can get it on Spotify. You can get it on iTunes. Basically, any podcast player you could find, subscribe, and that way you'll get it automatically of a Sunday evening just in time for your Monday morning commute. Thank you so much for letting me be part of your uh, life for the last 20 years. Here's to 20 more. 
Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye. This is amazing.